hit it. It's September 11th, 2020, episode 96. I'm Patrick Ceresna. And I'm Kevin Muir. We've experimented with different things in the huddle, but when we started the show, we always wanted it to feel like a couple of traders at the bar shooting the shit with some great guests. In that spirit, we're returning to our roots with a couple of changes to the format that will hopefully bring that atmosphere back to the forefront. It's a real pleasure for the first guest in our new format to be a trader with a wealth of experience on Wall Street. We're delighted to have Morris Sachs return to the show to talk about option trading, gold, and why hedge funds are a bad investment. Then in This Week in Trading History, we talk about the South Sea bubble. And for our WTF clip of the week, we talk about Drunken Miller going old school. We then introduce our new segments of No Stupid Questions and Skin in the Game. And Kevin, we might even drink some beers along the way. So stick around. We've got a great show. Lena, hop on. What beer are we drinking this week? This week, we are drinking Lake of the Woods Brewing Company's Forgotten Lake Blueberry Ale. All right. Hidden in the Lake of the Woods region on a small back lake, there exists patches of berries usually reserved for the discerning palates of black bears. This beer is subtle <laughs> with a clear, fruity nose, muted bl- a blueberry, low bitterness, and medium body. Although high in ABV, its finish is, is smooth and well-balanced. Okay, so for those who don't know, I grew up in Winnipeg, and my cottage was on Lake of the Woods. And okay. although I am loathe of any time a person puts a fruit in a beer, as a true Canadian (laughs) that's growing up on Lake of the Woods, if you're going to put a fruit in a beer, it should be a blueberry. Okay, whatever. 7%. This is going to be a good one. Let's see. Three weeks in a row, I'm drinking strong beers. Yeah, that's actually uh, not... I expected it to uh, taste worse than this. It's actually nice. (laughs) (laughs) We're going to rate the beers at the end. All right. (laughs) All right, Kev, give us some disclaimers, buddy. Nothing in this podcast should be viewed as investment advice. Listeners should consult an investment professional before making any decisions regarding topics mentioned in this show. Side effects of too much huddle may include the Nicola Vapors, the Euro Pumps, or the Timber Timbers. (laughs) I kind of like the Timber Timbers. Timber Timbers flows nice. Yeah, there you go. All right, it's time for our interview. Okay, it's our pleasure to bring back to the show my friend and trader extraordinaire, Morris Sachs. Morris, great to be with you today. Uh, Kev, thank you uh, for having me back. It's uh, been looking forward to it for a number of days. Yeah, I know. This is going to be a lot of fun. Um, For those who don't know Morris, he's the second time on our show, and he is a fellow of many talents. He's worked on Wall Street and worked for some banks and some hedge funds and He's got more experience than uh, Patrick and I combined, and we're looking forward to talking to him about all sorts of different things. So let's jump into it. The first thing that's on a lot of people's mind is gold and Bitcoin. One of the things that I know you're a big gold gold bug, and uh, I'm struggling, and I'm sure many of our listeners are also struggling with the fact that we are very, very overbought when it comes to the sentiment and with the the number of, of traders that are long. I see you. You're 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 staying there. You're not getting shaken off. How do you do it? What are you thinking? Okay. Well, it's um. The <clears throat> first thing I'd like to tell you is the thought that I'd be called a gold bug is such an anathema <laughs> for for everything that I've stood for in my life. Um, I've I just turned sixty, and oddly enough, on August sixth, my sixtieth birthday was the high. <laughs> <laughs> that's not the kind of birthday um, present you want or at least well, you want to stay keep going up there um yeah you know i got started in the gold about uh i don't know maybe uh about a year ago and uh the reason was uh for a couple things one was uh i felt like the u.s economy was slowing and the fed was going to um be lowering rates more qe that type thing and um I had a feeling the dollar was probably going to weaken. Right. Uh, but most importantly, uh, I was looking at the options on the gold, and the implied volatility at that point was like 12 or 13%, which right. seemed very, very low. Right. And uh, I was speaking with one of my uh, market buddies who actually introduced me to your blog, and we were chatting, and, and I kind of got hit with this feeling. It's like, you know, people people think of gold is a is a currency and 
it's not it's it's a commodity right and, and you know i i don't know that i'd want to get into a huge debate with anybody about that but but what that meant to me was that the volatility you're buying i don't think was priced right for what could happen with gold okay so um you know i accumulated a, a position in the thing and uh um figure and uh see what happens with it and then as time went by things started falling into place uh that i hadn't anticipated the first one was when that uh i think it was that iranian uh general was assassinated in right another okay. country okay yeah and then uh at the same time the pandemic uh things started and uh the economy started to slow and uh then once the 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 covid stuff started and the fed uh did their whatever it takes moment when right. you, yeah. i think you wrote your uh blog about the the stack of blue tickets yeah which, the was, which, was, right. which was awesome <laughs> um uh and then uh you know you saw what uh, uh what was a uh a biblical amount of uh um, money added to the system by the Fed and, and other central banks. So that right. that's really kind of gotten me entrenched. Um, so I, I guess the thing that I'd want to start with and, and, and really ask you is, because you said it's overbought and, and so on and so forth, but, you know, I, I've looked at it, uh, uh, and number one, it's gone sideways for a month. Yeah, and number two, and like I'm not a technician, right? I, I but I, I I play one on TV kind of yeah. thing. Yeah, <laughs> um, but the uh, the RSI is at fifty, which is right in the middle. Yeah. So, um, you tell me why? Why do you think this is so overbought? Well, I would agree that this is probably the healthiest uh, correction that we could have because markets can correct two ways: they can correct in time or they can correct in price. And when the, we had the move from 1700 to 2100, it was a big move. And then we backed down to 1900. And now we've gone, basically, we've been stuck between 2000 and 1900 since then. And I would, I would agree with you that it's no longer is overbought. One of the things that scares me, though, is it feels like every speculator you talk to has got this trade on. And I just, my little antenna goes up whenever okay. I'm in, in the group of, with too many people. Okay. So let me, l l let me um, into, in introduce you to a phrase and this is um, like a, a R rated show, right? Yeah. So, yeah. You can say whatever you want. <laughs> yeah. So, so let me, let me introduce you to a term I've invented called cocktail party bullshit. Okay. okay? Nice. <laughs> So, I thought you were going to say something really bad. No, that's okay. Okay, oh, I'm, just, I'm, just getting, <laughs> I'm just getting warmed up. Okay, um, all right. So uh, I, I'll I'll tell you my answer, but let me ask you. So you you own gold? Yes, own I do. Gold? Yep. Okay. Yeah. So in terms of Kevin Muir's net worth, yeah. What percentage of gold do you own? So I'm probably not the right guy to ask because I go and I I go up and down in the large leveraged amounts because I'm mm -hmm. staring at a screen all day. Right. So I'm just not the right person to ask because I'm comfortable going really long. Like there'll be times that I might have 200%, no, not 200% of my net worth, but 200% of my trading account for little periods that I'll be that long okay. and it'll go into a different thing. But I, I hear you. What you're saying is that on the whole, most people are, under invested in gold yeah well so okay so yeah. that i think that's the point i'm trying to make so like let's take a look at um uh ray dalio yeah um, you, you may know him as the mentor of p diddy <laughs> <laughs> i'm sorry I, yeah. I, I guess you can edit that out if you want no, um, no we, there's no editing here we let they, everything go they um so I looked and, and Bridgewater has five million shares of GLD. Right. Okay. okay. So rough math, call that nine hundred million dollars. Yeah. Okay. And I'm, I'm by the way, these are from sources thought to be reliable but can't be guaranteed kind of thing. Yep. Right. So anyway, they got nine hundred million dollars, but they manage a hundred and sixty billion dollars. Right. Which okay. is nothing. 
So, okay, so that's 900 million over 160 billion. So I can do that in my head. Like you said, that's nothing, right? Yep. Yet, if you look them up, they're easily top 10 holders of gold, GLD. Right. So now when you talk about the speculators, I, I don't really think that when we talk about um, people that are committed to this thing, I, I think that the real world swamps what guys that are just, you know, punting back and forth are doing. So the, anyway, that that's the long answer to your short question of the of the overbought thing. I, I don't yeah. I don't think that really um, it did. I, listen, I, I completely agree. I, I go back to that Grant Williams piece that he wrote and he, and he talked about if um, I think he called it if or something like that and or maybe what if. And he talked about the fact that if pension plans who had at that point 0.15 percent of their assets in gold, if they doubled that, if they made it 0.3, mm -hmm. what that meant for the gold market. Mm -hmm. And people don't understand how small the gold market is mm -hmm. in relation to other big markets like, you know. Yeah bonds and stuff and he went through and it was like it was it, if they doubled their assets to 0.3 percent it would entail them buying every share of gld and like half the market cap of gdx it was just yeah. some crazy number so i completely agree but how do you uh like i know i struggle with this the idea that when i see it go and i'm like i see this thing rip from 1700 to 2100 and I think there and I go, oh, God, we've gone a long way. I just I have so much trouble staying with the trend for so long. But yet, you know, we've been talking yeah. and you comment on my on my site and stuff. You don't seem to have any sorts yeah. of reservation I, at all. Well, and you seem I, to be much better at that. I don't know. Is that something that I'm going to get when I get a little older and a little wiser? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, first of all, uh, I've learned this by fucking all sorts of shit up. <laughs> Um, and, uh, you're going to get a little older. You're going to get a little wiser, hopefully. Okay. Um, but so, uh, let's go back for a second to when I told you I started liking the trade. It, it was a, um, uh, implied volatility deal that looked like it right. was very attractive to me. Right. So I bought, uh, calls and, yep. um, I have sat with them with a investment thesis. Okay. Right. One of the things, like if we were ever going to do a, 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 a show about like trading as a career or profession, one, yep. one of the things I try and make sure people understood is you, you got to have an approach that works for you. Right. So right. for me, I'm really good at saying I'm going to risk this amount of money and I'm going to follow this set of rules. And unless something really dramatic changes, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to touch it. So in this case, I felt uh, that once uh, we got to the election in November, right. yep. that to me was going to be sort of the decision time as to what oh, okay. to do. So, you know, I, I've been, whether it was probably December of last year where I kind of made the big commitment finally, um, I just said I'm paying my money and I'm taking my chances and right okay and so um, I, I've done these things where I've caught stuff early and huge and right and I've been caught up in this emotion of holy shit you know I just made seventy basis points on these euro dollar calls and I had a, a boatload of them and I'm just gonna just gonna feed a couple out and yeah the next thing I know I've sold my whole boatload of stuff <laughs> and they're, they're right and and yeah, i and, know that feeling all too well <laughs> and and I, I i i i won't bore you now but i mean i i, I left 100 basis points on the table a couple of times and, yeah and, and back when stuff moved right right and uh so this for the gold for me is uh it's a new trade like this is the first time in my life of owning yep. gold but I think that this is one of these trades that you don't see very often in your career. You have uh, explosive money supply growth. Yeah. You have huge deficits. You have an incredibly weak economy. And right. then you have foreign central banks, and you had the, the biggest central bank in the world 
uh, Powell. Yeah, that's his name, Powell, right? Yeah, I, I forget these things. Yeah, <laughs> um, they just told you they're they are not only going to tolerate inflation, they want to see inflation. Right. So I, I don't think you get you get a shot at this very often. And and so finally, even though the implied volatility on these things has moved up, yeah. Um, you're an options expert, so this will be obvious to you. But uh, for people who aren't uh, great at these things, the 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 cost of money has a big effect on what these options right. uh, pricing is. Okay, yep. and so the fact that rates are zero uh, allows you to own calls on gold at a substantially lower dollar price than That's you might right. have to pay otherwise. So yeah. once again. You know, if volatility was triple and rates were 7%, I, I, I don't think we'd be having this conversation. But, you know, all these yeah. things line up for me. So Right. So now you mentioned that the election was going to be your point where you're going to reconsider it. What do you think or worry that might happen at that point that might get you off the trade? Well, um, so I... I, I don't want to have any uh, indicate any bias, like one person's better than another. I mean, that, yeah. that's not the purpose of this, right? Yeah. But I think you do get two very different uh, outcomes. And okay. so I would say the conventional wisdom is if Trump is reelected, that's probably going to be better for the economy uh, right. from, a cap, from a capitalist's standpoint right. and uh, better for the equity market. Okay. That might get me to want to reduce the gold exposure I have and move it into equities. Okay. Because right now I have no no equity exposure. At okay. All. So okay. your risk on is gold right now. My that's gold and silver, which I could give you a spiel about if you want, but that's not necessary. Um, so the Trump thing would be something which may get me to want to potentially reduce. Right. Um, if Biden wins, this is a particularly, I don't know how much of these old war stories you want to hear. But, no, I would love to hear them. Yeah. <laughs> so um, uh, think of how I can map this out to make it most interesting. So anyway, I, let me let me take you back to Greenwich Capital, 1998. Okay. I'm in the lunchroom getting my sandwich. Right. And standing next to me are two partners from Long Term Capital. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And I, I won't mention their names, but okay. one was a Harvard professor and one was an MIT <laughs> professor. Okay. <laughs> and of course, by the way, they're eating, sneaking in our subsidized cafeteria. They're not supposed to Come be. Come on. Really? Oh yeah. oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It was like, it was like a whole big deal because, you know, they're clients and they shouldn't yeah. be in, but, but they wanted their dollar eighty bologna sandwich. So they, <laughs> <laughs> so true story true story so one of the guys i think it was the harvard professor built a wine uh case in his house to hold like ten thousand bottles oh god okay and the other guy the mit professor says what do you need the ten thousand bottles for and he says he goes through this yarn about estate taxes how yeah. if you buy these investment grade Bordeaux, you can keep them and then you can transfer them to your kids and the IRS doesn't find out about it and you don't pay estate taxes on it. Oh God. Okay. Yeah. I, I mean, that's the tip of the iceberg of what these knuckleheads are up to. But, okay. So, so anyway, fast forward to today. Yeah. So let's say Elizabeth Warren ends up being uh, the secretary of the treasury. Right. For, which I, yeah. Could could happen. Okay. Yeah, for sure. The, the first thing anyone's going to do is they're going to drop the uh, in the United States when you die is an estate tax. Right. Okay. Okay. So what I would imagine guys like that would do would be, and I think I have this right. If you buy that GLD, okay, the ETF. Right. Those are four hundred ounce bars of gold held and safekeeping in London. Okay. So what I think they would do would be they would go to one of the six 
qualified brokers, right? Physically take the 400 ounce bars of gold, right? And put them in a truck and take them somewhere and thereby avoiding the estate tax. Right. I, I'm not advocating that. I wouldn't do that myself, but you know, that's something that could dramatically change the supply demand of, of the gold market in, in that instance, or even people in India, you know, if, if they want to start, cause you saw a couple of years ago, Modi yep. changed all the currency. Yeah. He went digital, it, gave everyone a card. Right. And, and so, you know, you're, you're in a weird time, strange things happen. Right. I'm not, I'm not, uh, for an American citizen, I don't, or a Canadian citizen for that matter. I'm not a believer in the Bitcoin is a viable exercise. Um, uh, why, why is that? Well, um, I would say this, uh, so I've been watching the Bitcoin since maybe, uh, 2011 yeah maybe and i was getting ready to start trading it and about a week or two before the they were traded on this exchange called mount gox oh yeah i know mount gox okay <laughs> by the way mount gox was a platform for a video game but i yeah I didn't, that's right yeah way I, back I didn't, when I, I didn't know that till yeah. after okay but i'm getting ready to do a trade and as you may recall, somebody robbed the exchange of like a yeah. hundred million dollars worth of Bitcoin. Yeah. Okay. Well, that is gone. <laughs> okay. So it wasn't even a week ago, somebody scammed people out of $700 million worth of Bitcoin. Did, yeah. Okay. You saw that, yeah, saw, right? Yeah. And and then there was, a, was it at the Canadian fellow? Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. And he went to India. Yeah. And he and he disappeared. He quote he unquote died. Bitcoin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So so you've got these guys who talk about Bitcoin. It's the the Winklevi. Yeah, the Winklevi. That's, that's right. right. Okay. And you got <laughs> Novogratz, right? Yeah. So how does this work? So if I buy a million bucks worth of Bitcoin and someone yeah. steals it, I call Novo and he gives me my money back. Yeah. It's not going to happen. Now yeah. they would argue that they've they've got systems in place to make sure that that doesn't happen, but I'm a, I am a hundred percent in agreement with you, yeah. And not only that, uh, so many people tell me that they own uh, Bitcoin because it's nobody's liability, and I go, well, you own it at an exchange, and when you own it at an exchange, you actually have basically that credit is the exchange, and what you don't realize is that's some guy in his ba parents' basement that set it, that up. So. So uh, this is the, this is, let's go back to my, I, I'm going to have these t-shirts printed up. Let's go up to cocktail party bullshit. Right. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. let's say, let's say Kevin Muir has a million dollars. Okay. So if Kevin Muir is worried and wants to have his safety in Bitcoin, is he going to go buy $10,000 worth of Bitcoin if you have a million dollars? Well, what the fuck good is 10,000? 10, 10, excuse me. What good yeah, is 10,000? It's 10, all right. No, 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 you don't okay. need to worry. Okay. Right. Yeah. It's not going to. Okay. Yeah. But, but so there's no point in buying $10,000 if you're worth a million bucks, right? Yeah. So you should buy half a million. Okay. So I can just hear this conversation when you plug your little thumb drive in and you can't find your Bitcoin and right. you go downstairs and say, Honey, I got some good news and bad news. <laughs> the, yeah. No, it, it boggles my mind. I, I always say that Bitcoin is mainly good for, um, you know, getting money out of China or in an yeah. Iran or buying and, drugs on like the dark web or having somebody killed. But otherwise, I don't really see much point and, in it. And, 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 by, and by the way, those are real things. Yeah. Right. Those are those. And, and if I'm living in China or yeah. Russia or it's it's real. And yeah. if I'm a Chinese citizen, yeah, awesome. Yeah. But the United States, I don't want that. I don't. I mean, you're literally providing liquidity to tra sex traffickers, yeah. drug dealers, um, uh, despots. Uh, yeah. You know. 
Anyways, we're gonna we're gonna make all of the young people mad, uh, Morris. You and I talking ba- talking shit about Bitcoin. So let's go on to interest rates. You know, you you cut your eye teeth on interest rates. One of yeah. the things that I find interesting is the fact that all these bond bulls are completely convinced that the Fed is just gonna turn around tomorrow and peg the whole yield curve. Do you think this is gonna happen, and why do you think they all believe it with such gusto? Ah, uh, well, do. <sighs> Let me just think about how to answer this. Uh, I don't think the Fed wants to have to peg anything. Right. Um, I think they, uh, I just had this conversation the other day uh, because the Fed meets next week, right? Right. They're trying to figure out what they're going to do. Um, the Fed's job, uh, obviously, full employment and stable prices, and then providing the markets. Uh, with liquidity to remain functional, okay? Um, I don't think anybody can argue that the markets are, aren't, aren't functioning. They, they seem to be functioning perfectly fine. Yeah, a little too um, fine, maybe. It could be. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, they whether you, you love the administration or hate the administration, they came in and did the right thing, and they flooded the market with liquidity, right? Because it was a it was a catastrophic situation. So from here, uh, I think the Fed would like everything to just chill, and they wouldn't have to do anything, right? Uh, I would imagine they're really disappointed that the uh, the Congress couldn't get a, a stimulus package passed. Okay, I, I think that's a real problem. If you've seen um, 20% of American families with kids are food insecure now. Right. Uh, you look back in history, when people can't get food, that's, that's you know, nishkit. You know, yeah. that's no good. <laughs> um, uh, the thing about it is that the Fed can't fix that problem. That's I, ex- exactly. Right. It's, it's, it, it, they, they could fix it. If they were able to lend to individuals, right? Right, but that like that's I don't, difficult I don't, to, to. Yeah, I don't. Not, I don't. They can't do. I don't think that yeah. it's, not, it's not possible. So it, what happens is if they keep going with these programs of giving money to companies, well, people are going to go nuts, right? Because once yeah. again, you're bailing out the banks, you're bailing out Wall Street, you're bailing, out, but you're not helping the little guy, which is why this was nonsensical that the administration, not the administration, but the Congress didn't pass something because right. people, the people that, that don't need the money, don't need the money. The right. people that need the money, yep. they really need the money. So do you um, think that the, uh, that uh, people or governments or, or the federal reserve for that matter are starting to figure out that the fed can't solve those problems. And that really when they try to, it just creates uh, more Oh yeah, oh, I I I think that's I think that's right because you, uh, I don't scrutinize these speeches anymore the way I used to, but you constantly hear the the Fed guys talking about you know we need more stimulus we need right. more stimulus and and that's not that's not that, well, there's nothing for the Fed to do right the the velocity of money is dropping which means the money that's in the system is not moving through the system. Right. It's right? just sitting on the bank, on yeah. the Fed's balance sheet as excess reserves. So yeah. a question for you, the economy rolls over because we don't get another stimulus. Does the Fed kind of step back and say, listen, we've done everything we can. We're not going to try extraordinary circumstances again. We're not going to be like the ECB and go negative because that's what they should do. Would you not agree? Uh, because well. if they try to fix, if they try to fix the problem, doesn't it make uh, the inequality and a million other things worse? So shouldn't they really be stepping back and saying, listen, this is in your court now. We'll facilitate your spending, but otherwise it's up to you. I guess they, uh, they're walking a real tight balance here, right? Um, the question about negative rates is an extremely difficult one. Um, I hadn't really thought much about this, but... Um, Grant's interest rate observer. Yeah, they had an interesting point. So, if 
if you think about inflation is you know money you have uh, right. to buy things you need so conventional wisdom right now is there's there's no inflation or if you like steaks steaks are up 25% you know? yeah <laughs> but, but but if you're a retired guy you're earning zero on your money right and your medical uh, costs are going up 10% a year and your food costs are going up 5% a year. So seeing as your income's not increasing, that's real inflation to you. Right. Okay. Yeah. So then the idea of negative rates, by the, by the way, long out the ass, gold and silver, negative rates, you know, it would, you'd hear me yelling in Toronto from Greenwich, Connecticut. If they did. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't yeah, see no, that. I, I don't see it either. I, I think they're going to step back and say, listen, this is up to you guys. And because I re- think they realize that uh, when Bernanke did, it just made everything worse. Yeah. Right. But, but once again, I think the language is going to be very specific. You know, they, they, um, years ago, I met the guy at the fed, uh, Vince Reinhardt, who right. wrote the minutes for the yep. meeting and uh, I had a few nice conversations with him. I mean, every word they scrutinize, right? This right. is not some little nonsense. It's, it's not like, I don't know about you, but like when I write something, I'm just throwing work <laughs> left and right because who cares? <laughs> so I, I think it would be loath, and this may be hyperbole on your part, but I don't think they'd be like, Hey, we did what we can do. It's up to you guys. I, I don't think they would say that. I think no, they, but- they were monitoring circumstances, providing support, willing to use unusual methods and that sort of thing. But isn't that come down to why the bond bulls want them to peg the yield curve? Because they somehow think that that is going to be stimulative to the economy and that that'll somehow work. And uh, I argue that central banks, they've lost their power. They can't do anything except make a mess. Like they have to step away and let the fiscal agent do it from here. I I think the bond bulls are operating under because the only bonds you can really be bullish on are U.S. bonds because right. there's a positive yield. Yeah. And I guess uh, Chinese long-term debt. Yeah. Uh, I, I only mention that because I think those yields are positive. I, I wouldn't buy them because it's a foreign security and, and that's yeah. other issues. I think the bond guys who like the bonds are more a – we've got a – deflation or disinflation environment it's the best house on a bad block and by the way when the long bond yields 1.4 percent the convexity explodes right so if the yield goes from 140 to 1 percent you're going to make 25 percent yeah it's been a while it's i haven't heard from all those bond bulls that they get all hot and bothered about the convexity but i suspect that if we do roll over we will hear it again Listen, um, we're, we're taping this on 9-11, and obviously it was a, a terrible day. And uh, I think you have some stories about 9-11, or at least how you, what you kind of um, came to realize on that day as some markets moved around. Why don't we kind of jump into that? Okay. Um, well, if, if I can start before the, the, the day, um, a few years earlier, um, uh, we had a big push to hire traders. Right. And so, uh, I hired a Greek guy from, uh, um, Solomon brothers cause he had made all sorts of money trading long dated options. And, right. um, you know, I'm, I'm not very good with math and, uh, I, I kind of had the rudiments of options. Like I knew what a Delta was and, uh, gamma and theta, but I didn't really get them very much. And, and, and of course, you know, this is 20 something years ago and, and it wasn't that highly talked about in the markets. And For sure. Oh, I hired this guy and, uh, you know, he had made all sorts of money at Solomon and we get him set up and he starts putting these longer dated options. Okay. So what I've been very familiar with, you know, one month options, three month options, maybe a six month option. And this fellow started doing, you know, a two year option on a two year note, the yeah. two year option. Okay. And 
so uh, I kind of let him do his thing. I didn't really know exactly what it was, but I figured, you know, he was buying premium. I knew okay. the most you could lose, that sort of thing. Yeah. But what was happening would be like he would own a bunch of calls and the market would rally. And then I get the P&L and he'd be down money. <laughs> and I'd be like, I, I, I don't understand. Yeah. And, and, and so there would be days like this and the market would go down and he's long calls and he'd be up money. And yeah. well, anyway, I, I took it upon myself to really learn how these, these things work. Right. And um, so I got the papers done by Black Scholes and, and then Robert Merton and some of these other things. And the math to me is it's hieroglyphics. I don't, I can't tell you, but what they do is they kind of talk to you about what they're trying to attempt to achieve right. with these options. Okay. And in the Merton paper, uh, the thing that struck me was he talked about the assumptions that they built into these option models. So you, you were options. Yes, I was. Yeah. Okay. So they tell you that um, options, the, the market is continuous, right? which means it's open 24-7, 365. Okay. Yeah. Well, that that's not true. I mean, you ask right. the people that, you know, on Friday they had a position and Monday the world changed, right? Yeah, okay. right. And then uh, they talked about how, um, you had the ability to trade at every price. Right. Okay. They talked about the effect of, uh, of the fact that if you traded against your option, that that didn't affect the value of the underlying. It's kind right. of like a Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Yeah, right. right? Okay. Okay. And then they assumed, and I love this, that there's no uh, commissions. Yeah, which, I know. Which is, which is great. So... <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway, I'm I'm reading this paper, and I realize that each one of these things, in my mind, really makes the option worth more than okay. the I, value. That, okay, you right. see what I'm getting at? Yeah, okay. for sure. Yep. So, so it's that it's at that point I conclude there's no more of this short in options for anybody because no matter what you tell me, you're selling something that's too too cheap. Okay. okay. So anyway, I have that in the back of my mind. And then as time goes by, I think we've talked in the past that the bulk of what I did was um, cash futures arbitrage. So right. you'd be long one, short another. And, yeah. and so uh, put another way, you do these trades, which were considered mean reversion, right? Things are out of balance. You put the trade on, you hope for them to come back in line. Right. So something weird happens, a black swan event, yeah. the mean reversion stuff blows up. Right, for but sure. We, yeah. we learned that years and years and years earlier, so we would always have some sort of front-end hedge to okay. protect. Okay. So you so, were along the front end of the bond market because in the front end, in, 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 in an environment in a or something, right. right, they lower rates and that's why. Okay, it, exactly. Enough. Okay. Yep. So... Um, as we go into uh, 2000, yeah, the Fed starts easing aggressively, right? Because we had the dot-com bubble. Yeah. And so the yield curve, if I remember correctly, went from being maybe slightly inverted or flat to, to steep. Right. Which, you mean opposed to the, the, the crashing of the bubble after 2000? Yeah. 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 Okay. Right. Yeah. As we went through 2000. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Right. Yeah. So, so we've, we, as usual had built up a, a really, really large um, uh, book of relative value trades. And at that point, because the treasury yield curve had gotten very steep, it made these long dated options very inexpensive. Okay. Because of the, for the way the forwards work. Remember earlier today, I talked about how gold options were attractive because the interest rates were zero. Right. Well, when you deal with these front end options, when, when forward rates are higher, it, it makes the calls very, very attractive. So we accumulated a ton of these things because they just, they were, they were pennies. 
Right. And uh, we went about our business. And um, one uh, on September 10th of 01, I'm sitting at home and there was a wicked thunderstorm and uh, lightning hit a tree and the, the phones blew out and uh, the kids were scared. And it was it was a, a awful night. And I wake up in the morning and it's one of those days the storm had come through. It was crisp fall, not a not a, a cloud in the sky. And I, I go to work at you know six thirty or seven. Yeah. And I'm sitting on the desk, and all of a sudden they they cut to the the news, and there's the the South Trade Centers. There's smoke coming out. Right. And so uh, at that point, I knew. Um, my wife Cheryl was planning on driving to the city with a friend, so I call her up and I said, "You know, maybe you don't want to go in the city today." Right. Yada yada yada. She's like, "Yeah, we're watching on TV." And at that moment, the second plane hits the tower. Right. Right. And she says, "It's a terrorist attack, and it's by this guy Osama bin Laden." Is your wife she, a geopolitical analyst? How did she, she know that? She's just one of these people that just... <laughs> it's, it's, anyway, I'm like, okay, well, look, you get take care of the kids, go to the bank, get some money. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, um, the front end started to rally. Right. And yep. I had a meeting with my uh, partners. I'll say business partners, because that's the way you say these things now. Yeah. And... Um, one of the guys said, you know, the, the, the rates are going to collapse here. Right. And um, I was trying to think about, well, what do you do? And I realized we had all of these long dated options. Right. And so I'm, I'm like just everyone kind of uh, uh, get to neutral in terms of, you know, left, you know, outright exposure. Yeah. And uh, the market closed maybe a half hour later. Right. And, um, but you're a long gamma everywhere, right? Like you have no short. It was a huge win yeah. in terms of the, the, of the financial stuff. Right. We, we, you know, I lost former colleagues. I lost golfing partners. You know, it, it I, I don't want to for a moment say, Oh, how lucky I was. I mean, yeah. I, you know, I just, it was a terrible day. And I, I guess I, it, to kind of ask into the memories. I remember waking up because I heard some noise at like two in the morning. I guess right. this is like 2 a.m. on the 12th of September. And I walked out the front of my house. Now I live smack in the middle of Greenwich, Connecticut. Yeah. Okay. And between the military military helicopters and the and the F-15, F-16s flying over, I... I I, I was that was as frightened as I had ever been in my life. Yeah, I, I just felt like uh, I like who the fuck knew what was going on. You just didn't know, and it was a it was awful. It, yeah. was, it was and then the market was closed for several days. And you were were you trading? You were trading. Yeah, right? I was trading. I was trading for myself at the time, and uh, yeah, I think it closed for a week. Did it not? I think it was a, it was almost a yeah. week. And a week closed well, as well. The whole world basically. The, down. Um, that. Uh, area where the world trade centers yeah were is near like the downtown athletic club there was the bankers trust building and i think one of the main bank clearers uh they physically the building collapsed or whatever i mean you couldn't you right. just couldn't clear anything stock exchange was closed and uh, i think it also some of the pipes of the exchange were under there and so there was some definite issues in terms of rerouting the wiring and i think from then they've actually changed all of there's backups uh in terms of different kind of exchanges because let's just face it exchanges are now just basically a bunch of computers so let's yeah. talk a little bit about you know that was almost 20 years ago and it was a terrible day since then there's been a lot of changes on wall street and uh you know you've been in the market for 40 years yeah. what are the being the some of the biggest changes that you've seen during this time well the the obvious change is the speed. Yeah. You know, just, uh, when I started, uh, I had a part-time job in when I was uh, 18 working for a municipal bond broker and, you know, you'd type the bond 
yeah. uh, specifics in, and the, the, it would take a minute. I mean, like 60 seconds to run the, the yield. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty funny. Well, you know, um, I, I, when I was 18 years or less than 18 years old, I had a job actually settling bonds and I would have to p- take them from one bank to another. So I would, oh, pick, okay. Yeah, okay. Like I was a messenger and I used to, yeah. I go, go to school. I went to high school in the morning and then I would go and do these bond trades in the afternoon or bond trades, bond settlements, because that's all I was doing. And the thing is that there was a bunch of fellows that really weren't, um, they were career messengers and they didn't really uh-huh. work very hard on it. And so inevitably, usually what you do is you bring back the, the whole stack of them and you give them to the, to the, the clear, the back office, they would divide it up and send them out again. Well, I was one of the few, um, cause I wasn't a complete stoner that uh, could actually, <laughs> uh, divide them up and deliver them out while I was out there. So they would give me all the ones that were kind of close and every now and then someone would mess up and wouldn't get a bond and just go for a smoke or whatever. And it would literally be, they would lose $10,000 of interest because the it, bond it, would get, uh, it would, you know, it wouldn't my, settle that day. My first full-time job was at continental bank and in the training program, they took us through and there were cutoff times. So yeah. like customer to dealer was a certain time and dealer to dealer and yeah. dealer to broker and broker. It, and like, yeah, you had to. <laughs> Just batshit crazy to think about it settling actually physical certs. Like you'd walk around and you'd have to make sure there was all the coupons there because sometimes they take the coupons yeah. off. Yeah, It was just yeah. a disaster. But it's so it's gone faster. Do you feel that there's less alpha? Like, do you feel that it's tougher to make money or do you? Oh, the yeah. Things you do? Oh, yeah. Oh, phew. well, it, it depends on what you do. Okay. Yeah. So the guys bitching the loudest are the, like the old time stock guys yeah. who are saying they can't make any money, yada, yada, yada. Well, yeah. you know, they, they made money because information was harder to come by. Right. There were less regulations. Yep. And they had access to some leverage. Yeah. So um, I have so little sympathy for guys like that because, you know, we would figure in bonds, we would figure out a trade right. and it would work for a while and then someone else would figure it out and then the trade would go away. Right. So then, okay, then you go figure something else out. So now I, I should send this to you. I have a columnar pad that I did in 1979 that would be an Excel spreadsheet today. Yeah. So right now, if you wanted to know the, the price earnings ratios of the S&P 500, you could probably import that into an Excel spreadsheet. Right. Right. How long would that take you? Like seconds. Yeah, exactly. Okay. I sat in a fucking room <laughs> with a book oh. and wrote in the, I, I shit you not. I mean, so, right. um, so uh, what's but, happened? Is, go sorry, ahead. Go ahead. You go ahead. Well, so, you know, you, you hear about, uh, like Warren Buffett, I read that, the, the biography, the snowball, yeah. I yeah. think. And so, you know, he would go out and dig out this information that right. was publicly available, Yeah, but people didn't really look it up. Right. And yeah. so if you did your homework, uh, and you were good, it, it worked. Yeah. You Okay. But don't you think there's a new Warren Buffett somewhere to figure out a new angle? And don't you think that in hindsight, it always seems easy? Like, cause I know for me, I, uh, the number of people who tell me, Oh, you know, you were in the markets in the nineties. That was so easy. If I was around then I would have figured out interlisted ARB. Cause that's one of the things I did. I wrote a program that would buy in Toronto and sell in New York and do the arbitrage between the two. And it would do it automatically. And I remember my boss saying to me, what are you doing? And I said, I'm writing this program. And he says, I got 13 guys doing that. And I said, well, you know, I'm going to have one computer doing it eventually. And that's what it was. Mm-hmm. And I, and I, everyone tells me it was so easy but the reality was that it wasn't easy and that if yeah. there was a million people that were sitting around doing it the old way and I came up with the new way. And I'll have to be honest with you, I missed the HFT. I just missed it. I was lazy. I had been doing well. I was trading for myself. I let it go. And I saw guys make fortunes and I dismissed it. And it just feels to me like it's always tough is part of the issue. And it's, it's always tough. Yeah. yeah. It, it, it's always tough because... If you find something that's good, right? Yeah, you're going to run a bigger position, and right. things things move, right? So yeah. they, I mean, that's the job of the markets is to shake you. 
Um, is there ever going to be another Warren Buffett? I, you know, that's a tough one because I, I think he had a lot of really unique things line up for him. Okay. Um, so, for instance, he came in uh, with a very unique personality skill right. set, right? I mean, he's he's very meticulous. He's not a flashy guy. You know, there's the great story about him with Catherine Graham with the quarter, and she wanted a dime, and he wouldn't give her the quarter because he didn't want to waste the 15 cents. I don't know, you know this I, story. What, one second. What, what is it? Like, he... So there, C- Catherine Graham was like the – owner or the editor of the Washington Post, I think. Okay, yeah. And so they're at the airport, and she ne- needs to make a phone call. Yeah. And the phone call's a dime. So yeah. she says, can I can I have a dime? And he says, I don't have a dime. <laughs> she says, do you have a quarter? And he said, yeah. <laughs> she says, well, give me the quarter. And he's like, well, no, because the phone won't give you a change. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't that's know that's tough. a great story. That's tough. I that's didn't know that. That's tough. Um, so any, anyway, he came into the market um, and came in at a time when people were very uh, risk averse. Right. Okay. So on balance, the uh, price earnings ratios, I think, were probably a little lower. Uh, he got a lot of earnings back when interest rates were very high. So for instance, when I was telling you about my 1979 with the columnar pad, you know, the funds rate was 21%. Price earnings ratio on stocks was like five or six. Right. Yeah. So you've had a tremendous tailwind. He's rode the the real interest rate decline. Which is good for him. Yeah. Now, and I, I would love to have someone explain this to me, but I think there's a tremendous gimmick that he got hold of, which is he bought this insurance company, Geico. Yeah. Right? Okay. So they get all the premiums. Yeah. And they sit on them, and then they pay out as, right. as claims come in. Yep. But they have a tremendous float. Um, yeah. Float. Right. right. Okay. So he got to invest the float. Yeah. Okay. So my question is this. Let's say he was a shitty stock picker. Yeah. And instead of making 20% a year, he lost 40% the first year, 80% the second year. Who who underwrote the loss for the insureds? Yeah, I don't know that answer. So so I, I, I would love to know. Maybe I'm completely missing this, but I almost kind of wonder if this isn't one of these little things like you know, he com- talks about uh, moral hazard and, you know, like if he fucked up the investing of the portfolio, I'll tell you who would have had to eat it. It had been the taxpayer. Right, eventually. Yes. I, I guess I, there's, I, pro- I, there's probably a, a fund or something. The other thing that I, that I've seen a study on is the fact that when you account for the leverage that he uses, his actual returns aren't that good. Like if you took just the straight cash that he hold, held in there, and looked at uh-huh. the returns, it's not as right. good. But I guess the one thing you could say about him is that he does the most important thing, which is he never loses it, right? Like, you know, what's that? I think he says don't, the two rules of investing are um, don't lose money, and then if you see rule number one, like that's his yeah. kind of line about the two rules. Yeah. I, I, I would never, uh, I would never uh, ding this guy. I mean, he, yeah. he he's the real deal. Uh, as much as I'd like to criticize traders, because that's just my nature, <laughs> um, he, you know, he wrote a paper uh, in like 1975, I'm thinking, yeah, around to Catherine Graham again in the Washington Post, explaining how pensions work. And uh, I, I came across that paper in the late 90s, right. and I read it, and it's at that point I'm like, you know, this guy got bond math before people got bond math. So, you know, I'm, he has I'm, I'm going to go look that up. That's a great uh, kind of uh, yeah. little uh, tidbit. Okay. So we're approaching our uh, time. Let's just leave. You're you kidding. With, yeah, we're there. It's just flying Morris. We're almost, oh my at, God. we're almost at an hour. So uh, one of the things I'm going to just kind of finish with the last one, 
which is there's a lot of debate about uh, uh, active versus passive. And one of the things that you threw out there is you said, I also, let's talk about hedge funds as yeah. you know, hedge funds versus active versus passive. Let's okay. get into it. What are your thoughts? Tell me what you're thinking there. Okay. So um, I've been, I've, I've had some minor hedge fund experience working at a hedge fund. Right. I have been a hedge fund investor, meaning I put money. Okay. Yeah. And I've met fund to fund guys. Okay. Right? So I have some experience with this. And, you know, I would try and let me see if I can do this pretty simply. Okay. Let's say you've got $30 million as uh, you, you need to invest. Right. And you decide you're going to put it in hedge funds. Okay. So you can't give all 30 million to one guy, right? Because right. if something goes wrong, then, then, okay. So let's say you give 10 million to three guys. Yeah. Okay. 10 million each. Okay. Now each guy is going to charge you 2%. Okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. Let's just assume it's a two and 20. Yeah. So immediately each of these guys has to beat the market by 2% for you to start making money. Right. Agree with me so far, yep, right? I'm with you. Okay. Okay. And by the way, that, that's no, no easy chore, right? right. So, yeah. okay. So now the next step is if these guys make money, they keep 20%. Right. And you get 80. Okay. Yeah. If they lose money, they don't lose any and you lose a hundred. Right. Yeah. Okay. And by the way, even if they lose, they still get the two. Right. Okay. So now if you say, and I'll never get these numbers right, but if you say the market rate, the market earns 8% passive. Yeah. Right. And you get one guy makes 10%, which is great. Yeah. Another guy makes 8%. Yeah, which is fine. Another guy makes six percent. Well, you you get screwed because you got to pay, you know, twenty percent of the ten percent to the guy, and right. you got to pay twenty percent of the eight percent to the guy, and you got to pay twenty percent of the six percent to the guy, yeah. and then you pay two percent on top of the whole thing. Right. And if you just stuck your money in the market at eight percent, you got the eight percent. Right. And so do you, do you think that the hedge fund industry is going to continue to be under pressure and that this is something that, that the glory days of hedge funds are gone? And I, I, I hope so. I, <laughs> I, I think, I think, well, I, you know, there was uh, it, it's a little bit of the emperor has no clothes. Yeah. So, so you, I mean, you talk about being in this business a long time, right? Okay. So did you spend time on the floor of the exchange? Uh, so no, I spent a brief little moment on the at the at the Merck, and then every okay. now and then I would go down to the Toronto floor. But no, I've never traded like full time on the floor for any okay. length of time. So I had a summer job at the Board of Trade. Okay, there's a reason for this. Okay, yep. so that was open outcry, yep. three hundred guys screaming, and then I don't know now, but back then you used to have these things called MOCs, yeah, market on close, yep, and for whatever reason. Clients would send these orders in that would were market orders on the close. Right. Okay. And so you'd accumulate these orders in your deck. Yeah. And so you'd have a hundred buys and you'd have 120 sells. Okay. And so some of the brokers, instead of buying a hundred and selling 120, yeah. they would sell 20 yeah and on the curb they would go and we'd have closing ranges yep so the closing range would be like 10 to 18 yep and some of these brokers would meet their buddies yeah and the 100 sells would go at 10 to yep. their buddy right and the 100 buys would be back from their buddy at 18 and they made all this money right yep. and, and by the way this is in the public domain cuz the FBI right. bought a bunch of for okay. sure. I, that's a great story. For those who don't know, there was actually a sting operation in, at, the, yeah. at the different exchanges. Right. Yeah. For, fortunately, I had moved on. <laughs> but, um, but, it, but, but as, you, as you morph down through the years, you mentioned high-frequency trading. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's just – or 
Robin Hood. Yep. It, what was that saying I saw the other day? It's like, if it's free, you're the product. That's right. That's right. That's yeah. I think that okay. I think that's a tech stock. I mean, a tech uh, like a Silicon Valley uh, saying, but it should go. It should be also for traders now as well. Yeah. So right now, it's so ingrained to sell clients hedge funds. Yeah. That. Nobody's going to say it's a bad idea. Yeah. Because they're feeing you to death. Right. And um, I mean, that's why, like five years ago, I'm like, I'm just done giving people money to manage because I, I did that math. That, and, and finally, I, once again, I won't mention names, just is a philosophical approach. Take a guy that's been in the business for 20 years. Right. Okay. And he says, Oh, I've made 22% compounded internal rate of return. Bah, 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 bah. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's bullshit because the guy started 20 years ago with $12 million in his parents' basement. Yeah. And he did great. He made 12 and 24. Yeah. Right. So now he says he made 100% the first year. Okay. Well, a couple of things. One is he didn't withdraw the taxes you had to pay on that. He right. just said, well, now that 12 becomes 24. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. And then secondly, you know as well as I do, trading 10 lot of something yeah. ain't the same as trading 100 lot. You're absolutely right there. <laughs> and, and so, I mean, I don't, I just, you know, if you find the right guy yeah. and you're terrible with money, <laughs> I still wouldn't do it. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. I, I right. be a little more professional. No, no, just, it's, it, that's it's it, no problem just, at all. That's what makes a market. At, if you look at these billionaires, okay, yeah, did they make the money because they put their own capital at risk, or did they make the money because they got a drag on their clients? Right. No, you're absolutely right. Listen, there, there's no doubt, and I think that's why we're seeing the big compression in terms of fees from the uh, the old two and twenty. It almost doesn't exist now. A lot of times, it's one and fifteen and different things like that. Okay, last question for you, then we'll leave you. What surprises you most about the current state of the markets? Why so many people feel they have to have a position? Ah, uh, that's true. I think that's I mean, one of retail's big advantages that they have over institutional money and they don't take advantage of it nearly enough. Here's, here's, I'm really big on quotes and phrases. Yeah. Um, to be flat is a position too. I remember you writing that on, in my blog. Anyways, Morris, on that note, we're going to let, we're going to call oh, it a day. Thanks. It's been a thanks real so pleasure much. having you on. Uh, we really appreciate you taking the time. Sure. Take care. Patrick, it's my favorite time. Talking charts, what do you got for us? All right. Well, I mean, what a week, right, Kev? Like, uh, the, finally, market volatility is uh, is back in earnest. I mean, we uh, the, it, other than today, the last five trading sessions had intraday uh, ranges of 100 S&P points. I mean, That's what so, we want. Yeah, That's what it, we want. It's a little a, more excitement. Uh, it's it's some serious swings with huge fake outs coming in and out of the market. But what was interesting is uh, like when I throw, a, let's say, a 50 day moving average uh, on here is that the market is just hovering right at that 50 day moving average. And it's it's being held. It's like the market's at this edge of the cliff. And this is we're still at this like make it or break it moment as uh, as we're trading here. Will the will the bulls be able to save this? And, you know, you know what's you, interesting, Patrick, is that when you look at your chart and you see that, you'll see that in May, June, it kind of uh, pierced it a couple of times, but never really finished decisively below the 15 day. Then we had again late June, we had twice that it touched it. And now it, what, it went two or th almost three months without being anywhere yeah. near it. And now we're there. So what do you think? Is it going to hold? 
Well, you, I uh, well, this is what we're going to watch for uh, early next week. Now, if there was any place that the Bulls are going to make the save, this was a very logical place because um, the the gamma flip zone is right below here, and I'm sure there's a whole array of technical traders that are going to very quickly swing if the selling uh, comes in hard early next week. And so th it's actually a very important moment to find out what happens. If we're oversold enough that this could be a buy on dip. And, uh, and so my bias, though, is to the downside still, but it has not broken yet. And so until it has, um, then we, we have to kind of be watching as to whether or not this turns. Like when I put it down to a one hour chart, uh, what I would want to see on these futures is price action that uh, sees legitimate buying strength that does something a little bit more than that rally we had uh, earlier in the week that basically lasted no more than a half a day and immediately they started hammering it afterwards, right? And so uh, um, often during these kind of rallies, uh, usually that's the first sign that the buying is there and you wanna see whether or not it, it cues up enough buying pressure to create that feedback loop that starts the turn of the market and there's no sign of that yet. So far, actually, they failed at it. Uh, and so that's going to be really interesting. And but, but what's particularly interesting is to put it in context of the generals within the huge rally. And so it's worth talking about Tesla and uh, Apple, right? And so Tesla came right down to that 50-day moving average. It's got to bounce. But let's be realistic from, for uh, what was pretty much, you know, from a, uh, from a top to bottom drop on Tesla of 35%. Right. The, this yeah. this bounce for three days is pretty pathetic. You know, from a from a reflexive perspective, whenever we've seen such extreme selling, usually the bounce can come uh, with some velocity the other way. And so far, the bulls have not shown up. And maybe that's a sign that uh, there's more selling still to come on this name. Uh, another interesting chart is looking at Apple. And Apple in, uh, only ma mustered up a bounce for two days, uh, which was a very, very weak bounce and already got hammered with selling. But what's interesting is S&P, Tesla, Apple, all of them are just exactly at that 50-day moving average. And it's almost like those moving average and technical analysis works. Well, no, it's not that it's – it's not trying to say it works or doesn't work. But uh, often in technical analysis, the 50-day moving average is the arbiter of, of, um, of primary trend. And so uh, uh, the, in a bull phase, the market extends well above the 50-day and corrects back to the 50-day, but then uh, turns there and re-resumes its prior trend. And so if uh, it, it would be very typical – of the corrections to end at these levels if all we have is this little, uh, you know, one or two week correction on the downside. And this is like, this is why watching what happens early next week is going to be so critical. If Tesla and Apple are uh, getting hammered with more selling, the, the S&P might give out and we might have a two, 300 point drop on the S&P down to 3000 very quickly if, uh, if that was to, to start to develop. I, my bias is to the downside. I won't lie that I think that the market will break down uh, here. But the question really becomes, is it just going to be one of these 10 to 20% market corrections or does it uh, morph into a more ominous uh, uh, market decline? And you're laughing. Look at you laugh. I, I'm laughing no, no. because you're – it's only a 20% correction. Most people would figure a 20% would be pretty painful. You know, let's think about but, this. But, okay, put it, put it relative to what happened, okay? Stop for a second. The S&P 500, in the midst of uh, a huge economic turmoil based on a liquidity uh, injection surge, mustered up uh, a, a rally <laughs> – uh, of of epic proportions off that low. I mean, we saw basically in 160 days a 64% rally in the stock market, 1,400 S&P points. And, uh, and the one thing in technical charting and, and technical analysis is that often – corrections have a direct proportionality to the prior rallies. And so this idea that we rip 
in in a half a year, 1,400 points higher, and that the correction is all over in the first 200 points down? No, no. I'm, but P- Patrick, I'm arguing because you talk about 20% as you said only, quote unquote, only 20%. Like that was a minimum or that wasn't that big a deal. That's still 650 S&P points. Right. But, uh, but if you put it into an, another perspective, a 20% drop on the market, is the market only going back to the, its June lows? Yeah. No, you're like, right. Like, I mean, we that were there true. just a couple months ago. Right. Like um, I'll it, tell you that the people aren't ready for that. And you talk oh, about that is oh, they are not. Empty. They like are. Not. That will be very painful. And, but, you know, I, I think that uh, if the 50 day gives out, that's the base case, like a, a drop to 3000 on the S&P, a 600 point drop. I think that very much is the base case if uh, and that's why watching what happens early next week is going to be so important. Uh, and what I wanted to talk about, though, is uh, what's going on in the dollar. And I'm, last week we were talking about is it a bottom uh, on the dollar so far? Uh, it's um, holding in. It's uh, we're, we're five days into a bounce off the low. And there was a sell-off yesterday, and the sell-off got bought. And it happened as the uh, market faded, the ECB, uh, like when the ECB had its meeting, the euro tried to rally up toward 119, and and they gave it to them uh, into the rally. It it lasted no more than a couple hours. Uh, um, The euro is getting a little heavy up here. And then what happened to the pound? The, uh, the, The pound got pounded. Uh, yeah. like, and like this, this was a uh, pretty heavy, like I, was it, was it, uh, some sort of rumor that they were going to try to renegotiate the, it wasn't uh, a rumor. It was the, 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 the government actually passed legislation that said they were going to renege on the agreement that they had previously done. <laughs> um, and they just said, they told them to pound sand and it looks like it's going to get ugly. Now the question is, is this just a. Uh, negotiating tactic and that uh, we're going to turn around tomorrow and that they was just uh, Boris Johnson taking a hard line and then eventually yeah. the EU will turn around and, and we'll get it? Or is this to start something worse? I, Patrick, as you know, I, uh, I'm negative on the pound. I think that this is going to surprise people. I don't think people are ready for it. We've been so busy worried about the COVID. That's interesting because like, you were pretty bullish on it earlier in the year. That you you yeah. flip now, but I mean, yeah, I you're you're, and, you're a trader. Also, I understand. Yeah, and not only that, like the dollar, I'm actually l- along the U.S. dollar as well. I'm, I I think the euro. Don't goocher lower. my trade, you ass. <laughs> it's okay. It's 2020. I think we're good. We're it actually because everything's backwards this year, and it's so crazy. Then we might it, actually be okay being on the same side of a trade. Yeah, yeah exactly. I actually think it's yeah. going to be okay. I think okay. for all of 2020, because let's face it, 2020 is just screwed up. You know, like yeah. what, when you saw San Francisco this week with the the crazy, you know, yeah. Blade Runner type uh, environment, I that just was... thought to myself, it's so 2020. It is. It is. Yeah. So, uh, you it... know, one of the things that I think is going to happen is the euro pound is exploded higher. And I think the pound might drag everything else lower and in the process cause the U.S. dollar to rally. And yeah, so like, yeah, look at the, um, what do you call that Euro uh, uh, pound? The Oh, that's jag, the, the that's Jaguar. The BMW Jaguar spread. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's the BMW Jaguar yeah, it's spread. It's definitely a big move. But do you think that this is enough to turn the dollar? Yeah, I do. I think the next move in the dollar is higher, not lower. All right, I like it. All right, so uh, what, what is interesting to me, okay, so we have the Bank of Japan next week. And uh, the yen is, I'm going to remove this 50-day has just done nothing for yeah. over a month. Like it just like everything like shit is hitting the fan everywhere and the yen has not noticed. <laughs> like it's <laughs> it's like asleep. Yeah, it's asleep. Like <laughs> like it is in a, the tightest range I have ever seen this thing. I think even going into this it was the tightest range that it had ever been for a year. It's listen, explosive move coming in the yen. You mark my words. You want to be buying vol. You know yeah, me. I hate being. I hate being long vol. You know what? I don't have I'm the like chart the up. But we, Morris, what, has, Morris loves being long vol. I hate it. This but is one in of this the case, instruments. But it, but I, it, it, it's, uh, I haven't looked. Is uh, is the vol very low on the? Yeah, on it's the... coming in. Listen, oh, it's. Dirt I'm, I'm going to go revisit it. Yeah, I I love owning yen vol. I think it's probably one of the great the great trades out there. 
Nice. Okay. Uh, so moving on, uh, what a move in crude. Crude like, is rude. Crude is rude. Like uh, this breakdown looks, uh, looks really weak. But no, the question I have for you, because I have been of the opinion that the major, of course, the major lows in oil are because we're never going to see minus 40 again. So like, <laughs> like uh, so we can, we can, it's an obvious thing to say we've seen the lows. The, low, uh, the lows are in. The lows are in. I mean, that's a, a, a but let's, let's just pretend that the low, we, we're just going to focus here on the October contract, which is the lows okay. came in at 24 bucks. Right, I think the low. What, what was the low? Yeah, like twenty three bucks was the low on the October contract. D- do you think? The, my opinion is this is a buy on dip, and that uh, and that oil does not go all the way back to its previous lows. Uh, are you a buyer or seller on that? Oh God, something's weird. Like uh, twenty twenty really is a strange year because I completely agree with you, Patrick. Like it, or. I'm a buyer. I think that energy is going to surprise everyone. It's going to be one of the great assets to own. But I'm on my away. opinion, we're going yeah. to the low 30s. I think there's one more leg. I still think there's another 10% down on crude. And maybe we'll see 34, 33. But I'm buyer on there. I'm going to give it a shot down in those levels. I haven't bought any yet. I'm, I'm long a, a load of energy stocks, uh, companies themselves. But they've already been beaten up. Uh, pretty badly for months, and so. But I haven't taken a position on on crude futures or anything yet. But I, uh, my temptation level is rising with this drop. My temptation level. Well, I'm uh, I, I long. might. I, I might. Uh, I've been I might trading dip. it from the long side. What? So you're yeah, getting I've killed? Been, no, I've been like buying. Like I, like I, I day trade around and stuff. But I, I, the real question is, what is your bias? Are you starting with like a sell or are you starting with a buy? And although you might say I'm getting killed, really, we had two down days where it went down there, and since then it's been fine. It hasn't really done much. Are you are you doing some sort of like term structure thing? Or are you just going outright long? No, I'm just trading. Like I think I bought it a couple of days ago. I can't remember what it was. I tweeted it out on my like private Twitter feed. Okay. Which I don't actually let you, you know, and I don't think you. No, see no, I'm, I'm, I'm on the outside. I'm yeah. on the outside. Well, you haven't I, requested I, it for for those who don't know. For my subscribers, I have a private Twitter feed where I talk about shorter term tradings. But we're not going to let Patrick in on that. Well, we you to told me to let me in if I requested, but have I requested? It, yeah, no, you know I why? Just... No, honestly, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna fuck up my thinking. Like, you know what? Honestly, like I, I get in a zone with the market. It's got to be my own. And if I if I start taking other people's ideas, it screws no, everything I up. Agreed. I completely right? understand like that. It's, uh, it's like I don't want I, ideas I polluting read, my if ideas. I read, if I listen to another podcast where you're on it, that, that really messes me up. <laughs> Actually, that's not true. It's the greatest source of information for me, and I love trading uh, for against it. Oh against yeah, it yeah. For. All Sorry. right. So gold. Moving on. No comment. Anything else? All right. It's coiling up. You and Morris were talking about it, right? And uh, yeah. I was listening in, but like, it, it's just coiling up. You know what? For me, I kind of look at it in like my intuition. Yeah. Is uh, it's not going to let the buy on dip traders in that are waiting. There's a there is a whack of traders that say this is overdue for that drop to eighteen hundred, and then I'm just gonna buy it up right or seventeen hundred or or there's some even like the hard uh, the hardcore guys are saying it's going to go all the way back to like fifteen hundred on the weeklies right like somehow it was gonna do some monster mean reversion on the downside, but my my intuition is. Is that gold, like any type of thing that gets into a bull phase, it's kind of like the bus leaves the station and the people aren't on and they chase. The FOMO forces them to to chase higher and that actually is what builds the momentum. I think gold has all of the right things for that scenario to happen. We haven't broken out, but I think that that's there. I think gold is like the, uh, uh, the tropic suntan lotion in Dumb and Dumber. That bus? <laughs> yeah, that's. I'll, I'm not going to miss I'm getting on that one. There, I'm sitting there deciding if I should get on with, like, you know, and, I, and I'm too dumb to get on. Anyways, no, I agree with you, Patrick. I have a question, though, it, like technical guru question for you. Okay. So there's a there's a descending triangle there, right? Is that correct? Not descending. That's a horizontal triangle. Like, so, so uh, the 
uh, a horizontal okay. triangle is just but the thing is is that often it's a it's a, a deceptive pattern because yeah. uh, because often the pattern is actually a zigzag and what happens is that there's one more break and what ends up happening is everyone's looking at this consolidation yeah. and they're waiting for it to break and what ends up happening is it breaks down and then rips higher and wow. everyone starts hammering the sell on the break of the triangle to the downside and it's actually a buy nice See, that's right? the kind of stuff. That's what I like. I like technical an analysis where you're saying this is tricking everyone into this and then this happens. I like that. Right. And and I so everyone's everyone sees this triangle and we could have a short term break. But the, but in my mind, that would almost gift people to be able to buy the dip that are waiting for it. I don't know whether gold is going to do that. Now, I mean, listen, where where what scenario do I think it happens? If yeah. we have a liquidity in, let's say that this correction that we, there's no guarantee the correction is even going to have more downside. But even if it does, there's no guarantee it's even going to be a liquidity event. But if this thing morphs into uh, this kind of liquidity event kind of uh, crash type thing that, that I don't think it'll be anywhere remotely as bad as as what, it, what we saw in March. But Let's say we have that. I mean, at that stage, people get margin called and they sell anything and everything. The correlation of all assets goes to one. Uh, I think that like we saw back in March, that gold might first get hammered. But it would have to take some pretty extreme conditions for that to happen. And therefore, I think on balance, it won't happen. When things are so bearish that even Patrick thinks that gold will go down. <laughs> that's that's. You're getting to you're getting to uh, let's just say a certain website that thinks that everything. Oh my going down. god! You're getting right. very conspiratorial. I, I, you're, you're, you're saying that I'm I'm a full on zero hedge. I never use that <laughs> name. <laughs> it's, okay, it's what my, else? You it's got my for us? it's my favorite news source. No, just kidding. Okay, <laughs> right, let's go. Um, let's. Um, what's interesting is the grains. Right, we wheat has been pulling back. Do you buy the dip, Kev? I'm asking you. Well, I'm already long at the hoop, so I don't know what to tell you. I can't buy anymore. My margin broker won't let me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Are, are you I, long? I, the, I, are you long the beans? Because the beans have been treating uh, tre investors right. Look at that rip today. So I'm long all of them because I'm an idiot and I don't know what I'm doing when it comes to these, and I just have a thesis. So I just kind of like it's you know me. I'm so, so yeah. Scenario. You're just going like I'm going to sprinkle it along everything. <laughs> exactly. When you don't know what you do, you just buy them all. It's, <laughs> it's kind of like, uh, you know, an, an index investor. Yeah, so I own all the grains. I didn't even oh. realize the beans were doing so well. Oh, yeah. Like, I, honestly, and, I'm trying not to look and, at them because I'm long them. And, and I look just, at like, this I've... little breakout in corn. Like corn out of the flagging oh, formation. Uh, ripping higher. Like, And what's interesting is in spite of all of this and the dollar strengthening and all of that, even look at uh, what's happening with copper. Copper uh, has held up. Now, it's not a big breakout, but you know what? Every sell-off attempt in copper has defended and the buyers come back and buy the dip. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's holding up like a champ. Now, again, there could be a liquidity event that could change that, but uh, but but <laughs> I don't want to get so too far, bullish. I don't, don't want to accidentally bullish. get too bullish, but <laughs> it's making higher highs, holding what were previous highs. Overall, this chart looks very healthy. Do you know what I look forward to, Patrick? Uh, please I tell look, me. I look forward to the day you become such a like a pessimist that it actually turns into ever, all these are going to the moon. <laughs> so instead of being the deflationist pessimist, I'm looking forward to the time when you're like, the world's screwed. These are all going. They're going to double. Okay, so let's move on before I get, <laughs> get stuck in your trap. You're, 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 uh, you've got your web out, and you're trying to get me uh, stuck in the, Okay, 10-year treasury bond. We have a little bet. We have a burger bet going on here, don't we? Oh, I forgot it. What was it again? 140. So what happens if it ticks there? No, like you basically, I said it when the, you were you said that you're going to see a scenario where the market goes down and the 10-year treasury doesn't go up. Okay, so so far I'm right. No, the market what? hasn't. No, no, you, the, the the bet is not over. What do you mean? Sir. The market went down all week. Okay, would you not agree? The bet Patrick, is not Patrick, over. Patrick, whoa, whoa, one second. Did we say? Did, did we? No, one second. Just stop for a second. Did the market go down all week? It went down for one day. What like, do you mean? Uh, Let's pull up the week. 
Go give me the hourly again. Okay, now just walk, just look, okay? This hey. big drop happened okay. here on September 3rd, right? So okay. this drop here was the first, uh, September yeah. 4th, right? So, uh, so it no, started no, no. at 3500 no, no, so is, now it's No, no, so, so, sorry. We started the week right here. Yeah, right? We're lower. Uh, no, 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 not sorry. Ended the week when we made our bet. Yes. No, the market. That's a, you're, you're doing the low. You got to choose the close, which is the. Yes. Even the, I no, know. no, that is the close. No, no, I'm it's the day no before, th- isn't it? No, no, no. This It's this can- middle candle. This One, is the fourth. two, three, four, five. No, you're not. Oh, no, it was a Monday. You're right. Look at the date okay. at the bottom, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah, you're right. And so, so now uh, the, we started Monday with this big downdraft. It was yeah. one day. We haven't broken Monday's lows okay, with any velocity. We're lower. We're yeah, lower. okay. Let's face Give it. me a break. This is not the sell off that's going to cause the 10 year going. Bringing this Wait, shit up. You you're the watch. One. When okay. the if the market downdrafts properly to like thirty one hundred or something like that, we're north of one forty, uh, and I'm gonna have a nice juicy burger in my hand. From uh, thank you, Kevin Muir, for buying me a burger. <laughs> it's going to happen. You're done. It's, I'm telling okay. you right now. All right. So anyway, that's I just needed to bring that up. That I'm gonna still be right on this, and and I'm gonna uh, enjoy that tasty burger. What I wanted to point out. Is the rest of the global equities not moving that much? Look at the way. Not only is the euro stock pinned, I still think though if the fact that it spent you know a couple months or so three months just trading sideways is not bullish, mm-hmm. uh, and um, and so the fact that it couldn't, but it hasn't broken yet, and that's interesting. What happens when we have? broad global selling that hasn't started. This has really been a NASDAQ sell-off uh, and and all the things that have NASDAQ stocks in it. The the rest of the world hasn't. But what's interesting is look how bullish the Nikkei looks. It's oh, the, uh, it, I it, love it, that thing. I should be longer than that. That is like, that is the trade. I'm telling you, people are way too bearish on that. Everyone thinks that China, I mean, sorry, that Japan's going to end as like this hyperinflation mass. We listen to the you and all your doomsday crowd tell us how it's the end of the world. This thing, I'm telling you, you should be buying the Nikkei. Well, if that's the yen, if the yen breaks down, that's a tailwind. So that's uh, that's going to be. Uh, it's not going to break work. down. The yen's going higher. The other, it's going the other way. Wait, you're so you're bearish the U.S. dollar against the yen. Yeah, so I think that I think the yen's going higher, and I and think you think the, the Nikkei is going to go with it. Yeah. Oh my God. I know. No. Uh, yeah. I, good luck, buddy. All right. Okay. So so anyway, but it is but there's no denying that the out of global equity, Nikkei is kind of marching to the beat of its own drum and it's doing pretty good. That okay. uh, that I'll give you. All right. Anyway, so now I want uh, but what's interesting, I want to just leave it with volatility before I ask you what you're watching. But oh, the market's been more or less weak, heading lower, but volatility's been going lower into the selling. Yes. How Being weird is this? Yeah. How well, weird is that? I can explain that? that. I can explain oh, what you want. Indulge me. I because I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. So when Mr. Softbank came to buy all of his calls, right? Because let's face it, the last two weeks were SoftBank buying tech calls. What happened was that the dealers were selling them the calls and yeah. then they were worried about all their gamma exposure. So yeah, that bought, caused volatility to rise. Right. So they bought. So that was a strange time when they actually bought the stock market and the, the market was getting bought and yet volatility was going up with it. Okay. As, but this, but this sorry, big spike happened sec- on the drop. No, no. I, that, I think green was, candle, that green candle is September 3rd, dude. I think it had already started to rise. If you look at it, it had been rising before. Don't forget, the that, dealers are now short all sorts of gamma. So they're 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 scrambling for any sorts of gamma they can get. So maybe you're right. Maybe the it, it got I call worse you bullshit. Like, look, this September third is this big red candle. That's what yeah, caused okay. the vol spike. No, no, but the VIX had been going up since then. Uh, Overlay the, the VIX on this. Overlay the VIX on this. Here we go. And what one hour chart? I don't care. Which is whatever it is that you were just looking at. What, oh, what the hell are we looking at here? So we have I don't know. The, 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 yeah, the VIX is in orange. But okay, it's, so it, go but back. It, I, I, I don't, anyway, forget. This, this is too messy. <laughs> it's too messy. But, you got but, some driver error here. But anyway, yeah. listen. 
the VIX was going up. And so what happened was when things got crazy, yes, they went initially, the VIX went up. But as it moved away from the strikes on the tech stocks, there was less need for the dealers to be long VIX. Do you understand? Because everyone- no, I understand. I no, I understand. But 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 here's the thing. Okay, let me ask you. Uh, just make this call. All right. Monday, S and P is down fifty points at the open. We're down a hundred by eleven o'clock. Hundred S and P points. Uh, we're breaking through that fifty day. The selling's coming in. VIX goes up, right? For like sure. You're, but that's yeah, a like, big. That's. But the question so, is, so then it's a gift. That's then this, then it's a gift that the um, that the vol's been dropping because you were able to load up on on uh, your. I don't options. know, but what but what happens if the S and P's down ten? You just described kind of your Armageddon doomsday. No, website, I understand, uh, but but situation. but if but if it's only down ten, the vol's already normalized enough that you're not going to get hammered by the Vega. No, I think it's already the the S&P the S&P is down 10. We're going lower on the S&P. I mean, on the VIX. The VIX is expensive versus realized. We could have a situation. No, no, oh, my God. I wish I I I loaded my shit up so that I could look at these charts. (laughs) Listen, we're going to we're going to circle back. This is we're going to we're going to cover this topic next week. I'm going to have these charts ready. Anyway, let's leave with what are you watching next week? Well, I think you got to watch the lumber still. Okay. That was a, right. that's one thing, right? Remember we talked uh, about this, uh, and it's interesting. Did it not just go limit up it on the November? Up, are you are down? You, it's I'm like not it, but but it went limit up. Yeah, it's like, like crazy. it just it just like limit up. No, nope, we're not trading anymore. <laughs> yeah, well, no. So it went limit down, limit down, limit down. Then that then one traded day, a little bit. One the one day it opened down limit, went back up limit, finished back down limit. Now it went up, and now it's living up again. It's fucking nuts. It's a pretty wild. It's awesome. Kind of like are you are are you in it? No, no. Then you're then it, so you're just entertained. You're like nah. the gladiator. Are you not entertained? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're absolutely right. Here's something I see on your chart there: the U. I haven't written about this yet, but I'm I'm starting to pick away at the U. I, I'm a, I'm a buy and dip. Yeah. Yeah, with you. this thing is a uranium participation unit. This is in Canada. Then there's the um, uh, there's the American one. Uh, like, so this is basically pinks, right? a closed-end fund that owns uranium. Real James Bond kind of shit. And uh, I, I just think that when everyone was so hot and bothered by it and it was trading almost at even to NAV, I kind of said, I oh, know that's not for me. But now that we're back down to a discount, a big healthy discount to NAV, Nobody's talking about it. I think these are something you can start picking away at. So this thing, the uranium participation in the U.S., it's under the symbol URPTF. It's on the pinks, right? I don't know. I don't trade it there. Yeah, you trade in Canada, but uh, but Americans can get it on the on the New York Stock Exchange or like sorry through the American markets anyway. Yeah. But uh, it is worth watching. Anything else you're watching? What do you, what do you think happens on the Fed? I think the Fed's a nothing burger. Oh, that's same with the yet. Japan. Listen, everyone's so excited about central banks. Central banks are the sideshow. It used yeah. to be don't fight the Fed. Now it's don't fight the fiscal. It's all about the fiscal. All yeah. that the central banks can do is accommodate the fiscal. Remember yeah, that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Anyway, that's it for talking charts. Uh, let's uh, let's move on. So let's get uh, Taylor on here. For the WTF clip of the week, and uh, Taylor outdid himself again this week, oh, didn't he? He did. Welcome, first of all, welcome, Taylor. Hey, thanks so much for having me, guys. So uh, he posted it, and I was just, I was floored at how good it was. It's hard. He's got like some. No, you're working bars it up too said, much. Oh, you're right. It stunk. It, it is. Yeah. It, it's. Uh, I don't know. I like. I was like, yeah, this one's good, and then I sent it over, and you guys were like, oh my god, and I'm like, are they just? You know, I am we were volunteering drunk. here. Are they just bringing me, you know, <laughs> pumping my tires here? To, let's keep them on one more week. No, but it was uh, it was a it was a really fun one, and um, yeah, it's pretty much you know it's it's Stanley Druckenmiller Miller on C- CNBC when he's pretty much like, hey, you know, we all like a party, but at some point the party ends. And number one, it's who invited this guy 
You know, like take your four point four billion somewhere else, bud. And uh, number two is, man, old school was a great movie, and I think it just makes for a a, a tight little mashup. So I hope yeah. you guys like it. All right, let's watch. A lot of people on the air applauding Jay Powell, saying he saved the world. I just want all you guys cheering him on to remember the maestro in 2005 and how that worked out. You've come a long way since Frank the Tank, and we don't want him coming back now, do we? Honey, <laughs> Frank the Tank is not coming back, okay? That, that part of me is over. It's water under the bridge. I promise. Yeah. There's really no limit to what we can do with these lending programs that we have. I'll do one. I'll do one. I'll do one. Right now, we're in a, an absolute raging mania. Look, everybody loves a party. Yeah, I love a party. I assume you guys love a party. But inevitably, after a big party, there's a hangover. Because we're so far outside of the valuation realm with the Fed doing what they're doing, that doesn't matter. But I would say that the next three to five years are going to be very, very challenging. We're streaking! We're streaking! Woo! <laughs> Woo! <laughs> <laughs> So, Taylor, uh, if that's not the most popular one ever, then I will eat my hat. I, I, uh, you know, stop it because the uh, the Tom Cruise one might still be better. You think? Like, you know, no, but listen, this is pretty freaking awesome. Like, I'm not, I'm not trying to shit on this, but that Tom Cruise one is still my favorite. Uh, I, this is my <laughs> new favorite. The only complaint I have is that you missed the one line that I love the best when he says... It's so good it's, when it hits your lips. Yeah, I know. I know. I had yeah, it in you there. Failed. I was like, oh, once it hits your lips, but I wanted to keep it under a minute for Twitter. I'm up against metadata here, guys, okay? I'm really doing my best. <laughs> it, listen, it's pretty awesome. I, I, I am a huge fan. This is my new uh, high bar. This is, this is the one to beat in my books. All right. And, well, hold on. Before we go yeah. on, you guys didn't even ask me about what I thought about the beer. Oh, what do you think about the beer, buddy? Uh, I don't have it this week. Uh, I didn't get one. So. <laughs> I'm just I'm just drinking a Summersby apple cider. It's because you're up in Lake Huron. You're in the middle of nowhere. Oh Patrick's yeah. Patrick's like, are you yeah. going to drive it up there? I'm yeah, like, I'm not like, driving up there. <laughs> yeah, you you have to you have to come back into the city and get all of the sponsor beers. Buddy. That's right. That's, oh, that's, yeah. that's your yeah, own that's doing. Do. Yeah. <laughs> definitely, <laughs> definitely will do that. I'll drive into Toronto from my beautiful <laughs> lakeside cottage where I have windows and a life. It's just great out here, guys. You should come. You should come. Uh, I have no friends we out have, here. We you have, we, come. Have, we have patios on Young Street now, though. There you oh. go. You can sit on oh, Young Street her. as cars zip by and have <laughs> and have a drink. Great. Oh, it sounds <laughs> awesome. It sounds awesome. All right. Thanks a lot, Taylor. Th- thanks, Taylor. So, Patrick, it's time for This Week in Trading History. What do you have for us this week? Well, this week we're going to circle back uh, to the South Sea bubble. And, um, and so this, uh, this was back in uh, uh, around, uh, obviously, 1711, where uh, England became involved in a mania. And it's, it started in 1694 when the Bank of England, which back then was still a privately owned company, uh, became the sole provider for arranging and managing loans for the English government. And the bank took full advantage of this relationship. And England, being, uh, w- England was being financially bled out. So in 1710... Uh, with England now uh, p- paying for two wars, the Spanish uh, succession and the Great Northern War, they were uh, uh, desperate for proposals to pay off their debt. So they uh, first uh, they um, founded the first English state lottery, paying out the winnings in installments, thereby holding the entirety of the lottery revenues for their borrowings. And aside from making a small dent in the debt, it went to encourage more of these unconventional ideas, Kev, for how to actually come up with ways of dealing with this national debt. So uh, the government uh, owed $9 million uh, to the Bank of England, which was a lot of money back then. It doesn't sound like a lot, but it was back then it was a lot, with no idea how to pay it off. And that is until the South Sea Company uh, scheme, or scheme as I would say, <laughs> which, which, 
<laughs> yeah, you got to keep up with the the, the Patrick the pronunciation sh- uh, scheme. Like, like don't uh, be what, changing it proper now. Okay, all right. The scheme w- uh, was suggested by uh, William Patterson, one of the uh, founders of the Bank of England, uh, and it's a great example of creative accounting. Right, so let's let's talk about it. So Patterson put together a proposal to pitch uh, to the government. The bank uh, thought that uh, the government should form a new public-private partnership company to create nine million dollars worth of shares to actually ha- be held by the bank. Uh, and so uh, they were converting the debt into shares, and all the sh- uh, the the debt holders would convert. So then, to service the loan, the government would pay the bank shareholders six percent interest. Uh, which is labeled as a dividend. Then when the government had essentially privatized all their debt, so they basically convinced all the, uh, the holders to convert into the company, uh, they would arrange that England would after um, uh, be awarded the South Sea Company uh, the ability to mono- have the monopoly for trading with the South American ports, which were controlled by Spain, uh, with whom Britain was currently at war with. Uh, and this would be good for the government as the debt would be paid off and uh, it would be great for the bank who would get to keep all the gravy and excess profits. And so you can always count on uh, a banker to uh, see a debt as a way to create a profitable situation for themselves. But keep in mind that all of these future profits of the company hinged on the end of that war and the resumption of trade. And so it was uh, in uh, 1711... Uh, they made the proposals to the government who accepted this debt conversion deal. So it was on September 10th uh, of 1711 that the, this day in history, this week in history, where the South Sea Company was chartered in London. So then uh, two years later, when uh, the war ended, the government awarded the South Sea Company uh, with the trade contract. And uh, even though the business was operating, it was funny because like they thought that it would become as lucrative as the uh, East India Company and all these different things. But in the end, they were allowed to like send one ship a year to each of those ports. And so it ended up being a, a nothing burger. But the South Sea Company still kept issuing more shares, took more loans and ran financially amok. Uh, to make things even more uh, perilous for the company, uh, when the war broke out uh, with Spain again in 1718, the company who held the other end of the trade deal with England was seized and then suddenly disappeared. But that didn't stop them, Kev. Uh, so the, <laughs> the Bank of England then suggested they assume even more of the government's debt, which gives us a pretty good deal, which uh, was again accepted, and it was in January of 1720 when uh, the real bubble really accelerated, where the price started at a tra- a trading around 128 uh, pounds per share. Uh, and here comes the first pump. So the d- directors circulated false claims of, uh, of um, success uh, in, uh, all, in all of the South Sea riches. And the st- stock immediately rose to 175 pounds uh, a share in just one month. Now, the government had a little taste. And the directors went back and pitched uh, to assume even more of the national debt in exchange for shares of the South Sea uh, Company stock. Uh, for their compliance, the board would award the high-ranking lords and MPs with unofficial warrants and stock kickbacks to approve the deal. Nice. Gre- greasing the politicians. That's a, a, a long, true history that starts back here. Uh, so uh, the higher the stock price, the more money these MPs and officials received. Sometimes they were making 500 pounds per single one pound move in the share price. And so uh, then the stock price proceeded to rise to 330 uh, pounds by the end of March. Um, and for context of the times, there were tons of new company flotations soaking up all of the capital around Europe. And so by the middle of 1720, uh, it became known as the bubble year. They started using the word bubble back then. Oh. The market was filled with wildly specul- speculative and shady 
schemes, right? <laughs> schemes. <laughs> so during the the uh, the whole time, the South Sea's uh, other uh, banking partner was merging uh, existing chartered companies with harebrained uh, schemes for the purposes of. <laughs> Patrick, really different from their original creation. So this is like this is like the original SPACs. They yeah. basically turned around and they just like engineer the money and turn everything around and twist it. Like it, you're gonna it, you're gonna get our, our good friend Benjamin Kwasnick from uh, SPAC Research all upset with comments like that. Um, listen, I have a question for you. This was 1720. Yeah, and they called it literally the. A bubble year? Uh, it would stop. I'm getting to this. Anyway, so l- l- listen. Anyway, okay. the bank was shady. The investigation ensued. Yet uh, the oversight committee was flooded with MPs with personal stakes in the company. Nice. Uh, and so they were uh, free to continue on operating because everyone had their pockets greased. But get this. So in response, the government passed what is known as the Bubble Act. They Come used on. the word bubble. It really? was in June of that year they passed in the term. So the term bubble I'm originates this from as the, you say this because I don't believe you. You do it. The Bubble <laughs> Act. Here it uh, is. It, it, yeah, there you go. Uh, so requiring all the joint stock companies to receive a royal charter. Basically, they're trying to corner the market by needing a royal charter to be able to compete. Uh, so it's basically their way of monopolizing and controlling the competition. So surprise, surprise, the South Sea Company was granted the charter, which was seen as a vote of confidence. So by the end of June, the share prices had a screaming rip to 1,050 pounds. Come on, uh, really? Yeah, and uh, it was around uh, that 1,050-pound level that the selling started, and it just it took a life of its own, almost Tesla style. And um, and sensing the intense fear, the Bank of England had an idea to prop up the share price. Uh, the the company would lend money uh, to people to buy its shares. Their first margin accounts originated. On the, uh, from the South Sea bubble, uh, the Bank of England was uh, was giving pe- loaning people money to buy shares. This is awesome. I As had resu- no idea the Bubble yeah. Act. The Bubble Act. And it As was a result- what, oh, sorry, one second. I didn't want to. This was three hundred years ago, almost to the day, Patrick. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 it's, it's a little spooky. It is spooky. As a result, many shareholders couldn't pay back the money for the shares except by selling them at their current price and, uh, and or doubling down. So basically, you had the traditional margin call. Nice. It started with the South Sea Company. So bankruptcies ran rampant, and by the end of September, the stock had fallen from $1,050 to 150 bucks. Good thing that can't happen to our tech stocks. No, and it certainly won't happen to Tesla. And so uh, uh, bankruptcies ran rampant. He's a genius, you know. Yeah, he is. (laughs) And uh, and by the end of September, the stock had fallen – uh, and so it was uh, it ruined banks, goldsmiths and many members of the um, aristocracy. Uh, many of oh, those God, you butchered uh, that one. But uh, aristocrats, aristocrats, <laughs> I guess, uh, I'm aristocrats. not because you got me all messed up now. Many of aristocrats, the aristocrats. I'm pretty sure that was a Disney movie that we watched as kids. <laughs> Keep going, though. <laughs> anyway, many of those uh, crooked MPs were imprisoned w- uh, with corruption. And even that was the good old day when Sir Isaac Newton, uh, we already talked about this in a past one, was one of the holders of 22,000 pounds worth of the sto- uh, South Sea stock. And famously, after being zeroed, went on to say, I can calculate the movement of stars, but not the madness of men. That's awesome. That's a great That's, story. I had no idea. The Bubble Act. It's awesome. It's, the Bubble Act. The word bubble has I know. come. I had no clue. I had no clue that that existed. That was great. All well right. done, Patrick. All right. Kev, it's time to move on to a new segment we're introducing, right? That's correct. No stupid questions. What are we doing, Kev? <laughs> I don't know. Lena, you got to <laughs> hop on. You got to help us out. What? <laughs> we had we had lots of uh, questions submitted, actually. We were That's inundated right. in our inbox. You guys have to go through a whole bunch of questions to see so what we you took, guys we are took, comfortable We decided answering. Ben's question. 
And Lena is going to be the one asking yes. Ben's question. And here we go. So, yes. Lena, read it out to so us. Ben's all. First Everyone question. likes hearing you, Lena, as yeah. opposed to our voices. <laughs> Let me see if I can read it properly okay. after a beer. <laughs> Um, I really enjoy the conversations about options and gamma exposure. However, how do dealers make a profit if they are forced to continuously delta hedge a long or short option position? Could you please give an example? The concept of delta hedging makes complete sense. I just struggle to see how it's profitable for a dealer or market. Okay, that's a great question. And uh, I think it's particularly apropos today uh, or recently with the SoftBank guy coming along and buying all these options. So let's go through what happens when a dealer sells a client an option and then hedges it. So, Patrick, let's pretend you're SoftBank because this is the kind of crazy oh, that's thing that you'll appropriate, do. Appropriate, appropriate. Yeah. I'm long gamma. So, yeah, it's true. <laughs> it's actually true. So, let's take something like what do you think SoftBank would like? Um, uh, Apple. We're, I'm Apple. buying Apple. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm buying Apple calls. Okay, so let's and, say- and more importantly, I want 25,000 contracts. <laughs> that's right. You don't mess around. And and okay. that was pre-split. I want I wanted at the uh, I want the five hundred dollar price calls. Did he buy twenty five of the pre-split ones? I don't know. I'm just making shit up. But let's, okay. let's just anyway, go with it. Let's say you bought twenty five of the like uh, right now. Let's just say it's so like not twenty five. Twenty five thousand. Yeah, I get it. Twenty five thousand. Oh. So okay. you go. I sell you the twenty five thousand contracts. Um, and let's say you're buying it and you're the, short a shitload of gas. That's right. So let's say I sell you the one twenty one twelve call. Okay. So I'm short 25,000 contracts. I go and I say right now there's a 50% a 50 a 50 delta meaning that there's a 50% chance of that contract it's going to finish in the money. So 25,000 times 100 gives you the number of shares. So that's 2.5 million. So I go out into the market and I buy one and a quarter million shares to hedge my option that I sold you. Now Let's just say, let's actually pull this up and let's let's get the actual prices of um, of a contract that is e- equivalent. So there's a 112. What do you want to do, Patrick? You're the, you're I'm, the bank. Which one do you uh, want to do? I'm going to, I want the, uh, the, let's just do 115s. Oh, you want to do the 115? No, no, let's do 112s because they're nice. Right, or, or okay, right, right at the money. 112s at the house. money. But how long do you want to do? Let's just say. Uh, I, I want one month. I want, I want the big gamma. Okay, so one month, and we'll just say, so what is that, October 20th, October 9th of 2020, okay? Right. So I'm going to sell you that call, and it's the current market is 565 to 590. You know, you're, you're buying size, so I sell it to you at 6 bucks. We'll just use an even number, okay? Now, I'm going to earn that $6, right? And what's going to happen in the meantime is that I'm going to go and delta hedge it. And so as the market goes up, I will buy some shares of Apple because the odds of it closing in the money increases. And then as it goes down, I'm going to sell it because the odds of it going out at zero will, you know, increase, meaning yeah. that the, the odds of it finishing the money will decrease. During this whole time, as it kind of rifles around, I will either be buying it as it goes up or selling it as it goes down. This These trades that I do as the Delta hedging will, in essence, most likely lose money, okay, because I'm chasing up and going down. But don't forget, I got paid $6 for the option in the first place. You just got cracked a $6 nut. So the question is, do I lose more than $6 continually delta hedging over the period of that option? Of that one month. And that delta hedging... That the, 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 that buying high and selling low, the profitability of that or how much I'm going to lose, being short, is dependent on how volatile the stock is. Right. So let's imagine the stock goes up to 130 and then back down to 110 and then back up to 120. I'm going to get crushed because I'm going to be chasing yep. it all the way up. I'm going to be chasing it all the way down and then I'm going to chase it back up. But let's imagine that it just kind of goes quiet. Even though Patrick's hugely bearish right now, the market just gets <laughs> really, really quiet and it doesn't go anywhere. So I, in essence, just sit there buying and selling little bits. And as it kind of it shows which way it's going to go, you know, let's say it moves up to 115 nice and gradually. Then gradually I'll buy stock and then I'll sell it to I'll basically you'll exercise your call 
and I'll have bought all the stock to sell it to you. And that's what it is. So the whole point is whether the amount extra that you pay for the option, that's what's known as the implied volatility. And yeah. does the realized volatility end up being higher or lower over the course of that option? And that determines the profitability of the dealer's position. Right. Does that make sense? Uh, totally. Actually, let's ask I, I, Lena. I, Lena, do you, does that make sense to you? <laughs> a little bit? Me off guard. She needs another beer. All right. I do I, need another well, beer. Well, you know what? I'll try it again next time if you don't get it. Now, there's a second no, question, I, isn't there, Lena? Yeah. Yes, there is a second question from Ben again. Um, would you be willing to share how you were trained to manage both risk and emotions when you were working at the bank? Also, if you are willing, maybe talk about how your risk management has changed as you've entered a different stage of your life. Okay, so first of all, I think this is funny that we were trained to manage risk at the bank. That is not <laughs> how a bank works. <laughs> okay, Ben, just a little heads up. And I, listen, I'm old, so when I was there, it was basically eat what you kill. If you could like cl climb over the pile of other bodies and get to the top, you're going to get given risk. There was no, there was no training. What you ended up doing though, is watching people around you. And this ended up being one of the most important things is being in an environment where you could see other people doing it and you learn by, by example. And for the longest time, that's why certain banks and certain cultures pr produced more good traders. Let's just take in the States, for example, Goldman Sachs, terrific risk takers, really understand stuff. There's no, there's a reason why some of the greatest hedge fund managers come from there. Leon Cooperman, all sorts of people have come from there. It's a great place to be. They teach you and it gets passed on. Nowadays, it doesn't matter as much because the internet and Twitter and a million books, it's actually, you can learn these things anywhere. Um, and so one of the things though, that you say, has it changed as I've entered different stages of my life, as I've gotten a little wiser, I've realized that the volatility is not really what I'm going for. I like to say that I liked my good trading is boring. Like the, I think there was a market wizards fellow that said that. And one of the things is if you think about a casino owner, they don't sit there and whoop it up on every you know day. They just kind of try to consistently earn their, you know, yeah. apply their edge and consistently yeah. earn it. And one of the things is that as you get older and you realize that you actually get more numb to all the goods and the bads. So I don't know about you, Patrick, but I don't get as excited on the good days, but neither do I get as bad, you know, upset on the down days. You know, but after time, you get desensitized uh, to large numbers. I, I think that that's one of the biggest things that happened to me when I was trading at the banks was I got used to uh, tossing around millions um, when, you know, before as a kid, you know, even a, a, a couple hundred dollar swing actually – uh, triggered an emotion and and just uh, years of trading large numbers you just become desensitized to it it's, it's like a bizarre thing but it doesn't make it good i'm not trying to say that that's a thing but uh, it just it's hard to trigger an emotion out of me from seeing a small swing right because it's just are you desensitized to it or is it still um i don't know because as a percent as a percentage of your equity it still matters so I, 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 I find I get more upset. This is what I get upset with. I get upset when I don't follow the rules that I knew were yeah. what I should be doing. And yeah. so when you talk about has risk management changed as you've entered different stages of life, I wouldn't say the risk management has changed, but I've woken up to the, the, the real key to long-term success is not counting on any one trade to save you. The moment I start thinking, oh, it'll only be okay if this trade works out, that's wrong. Yeah. I trade best when I almost don't give a shit about each trade. And that you is... Just, what, you, just, so, you just built your, you built your portfolio and you go with it. Yeah, you just keep going and applying your edge. So when you ask about how risk yeah. management is changed... I trade a completely different way, but that's what makes a market, right? Yeah. Like, uh, we'll, talk, we could, we'll elaborate on in future future. Anyways, podcast. Ben, thank you very much for the question. Really appreciate it. And we thank you, everyone else that uh, sent yeah, us. Yeah, and then, listen, everyone else, send us questions. Well, actually, Lena's going to say that. That's Lena, right. Come Lena. on and tell everyone. <laughs> you, you say it because everyone believes you and does what you tell them to do. That's right. <laughs>
we welcome all questions. There are no stupid questions. So if you have any questions that you would like Kevin or Patrick to answer, please send them to no stupid questions at markethuddle.com. There's only all stupid right. answers, which I've managed to do today. <laughs> Okay, Patrick, I've been looking forward to this next oh. one for a long time. So here, um, let me tell you, let me tell us everyone about what it is, okay? So we're introducing it's our new segment. It's our new segment. It's called Skin in the Game, which is I love it. A little, yeah. Anyways, uh, Skin in the Game is a weekly opportunity for us to demonstrate that we are de- degenerate gamblers at heart. Okay, <laughs> every week, this is how the rules go. Every week, one of us presents a wager. And the other guy chooses which side of the bet he wants. Okay. Now, the key about these wagers is that every wager needs to be settled by next episode. Okay. Right. And then the really great part about this is the currency for the wagers is as follows. We call this the market huddle currency. Okay. The first one is a Duke and Duke. And Patrick, why don't you tell everyone what a Duke and Duke is? A Duke and Duke is just a, a $1 bet. That's right. From the, the great movie Trading Places. But we're going to get American $1 bills because I'm not trading loonies. Yeah, we are, that's true. A Duke and Duke is truly a dollar, you know. And the rate American the lo- paper dollar. That's right. And the rate that the, the, the loonies were going these days, that might be worth like three bucks soon. Okay. Uh, inevitably. The, the next one. So these are the currencies that we're going to do in terms of the bets. The next one is a pint of beer. Then yeah. a burger bet. Then a pitcher of beer. Then a case of beer, which is otherwise known as a 2-4. I don't know if Americans say that, but we definitely say that. Yeah. Then there's a bottle of wine. Now, these are nice wine, not the shit that Patrick drinks. It's We're going to put a $100 <laughs> limit on it. And then finally is the steak dinner. Love it. Okay. Love so it. So the way it's going to work. Bet, every bet starts as a Duke and Duke. That's right. And so the, the winner of the bet is obligated to create a new bet for the following week, of which point the other guy gets to choose it again. And then here's the important part, Patrick. This is like, okay. you know, people talk about swap netting and stuff like that. Th- yeah. That's nothing compared to this. All wagers yeah. need to be settled in full, and there will be no netting of positions. No netting. I agree. <laughs> that is a rule. No netting allowed. It's not like I, I'm owed two steak dinners and you're owed three, so we're going to net two of them out, and nope. we're just going to have the one. We're no. going to eat five Ev- steak dinners. Five steak dinners. <laughs> Every bet is paid in full. Okay. So, Patrick, right. I have drawn the straw, and I will be going first with today's or this week's wager. All right. I'm so not, just a reminder. So Patrick doesn't know this. He legit doesn't know this, Okay. I have no idea what you're. So about to I'm going to tell him a bet that has to settle next week, and then he's going to choose which side he's on. So Patrick, pull up your trading charts. It's going to be on the S and P 500. Okay. Okay. So here is my my wager to you, Here's Patrick. Here's the spoos. Yeah. Spoos. And we're going to use. We're... I'm going to. I'm talking about the September contract because if I'm not okay. mistaken, it settles next next week. Okay. And I am going to say to you. Are you are you like? But when is the last trading session of it's, September? Friday morning, like it settles in the morning. So that's very important on this next bet. So Patrick, here it is. The S&P future for September expiry will finish. Will this is settle, a trap. Will settle above 3280. 3280. Okay, so is- it's a settlement we're talking about. So that Friday morning... You you know what this is you're like this is a trap. Yo, of course it's a trap. Patrick, of course. Yeah, oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> Screw you. <laughs> I'm taking it's below. Screw you. <laughs> I knew you. I'll would. take it. You you know what? You you it, I'll take it. Duke and Duke is the starting wager. I take below. Okay, so now the way the rules are... It's right at the freaking 50-day moving average, too. This is brutal. But I'm taking the... Okay, so you're going to take pull out. Now, at this point, what's going to happen is that I have the opportunity to try to increase the bet size, and we're going to keep increasing it until one of us says, no, that's good enough. Okay? So I personally feel strongly enough about this. I'm willing to go up to a pint of beer. A pint of beer. All right. No, 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 no. We're going up one. Okay. Uh, I, uh, I'm, I'm definitely, I'm feeling, uh, I'm feeling a pitcher. Oh, you're, uh, I, I'm, well, I'm we raising, haven't set the rules. Oh, no, we have to are, go. Are we allowed to oh, jump no, no. two? No, 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 no. Okay. No, fine. I'm raising you to a burger bet. Yeah. You're not allowed to jump two. Um, I'm raising to a burger bet. 
Well, I feel pretty okay. I'm fine. Pitcher, you're done. You're done on a pitcher. All right, and you could wait. Well, wait a second, me. You're done. I, mean, I could raise you. Okay, but I'm gonna I'm gonna stop there. Okay. You go ahead and Pitcher raise me if you want, and so you have the okay. Have the, you, okay now that I know that, I'm gonna I'm going to say case of beer, no tears. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna stop. come on. We're stopping in a pitcher. The first one's a All pitcher. Right. Okay, All so right. just a reminder. No, but no, but that, so it's not because it's gonna because by then the continuous contract is gonna have rolled to December. Yeah, it's and the so settlement. We are, it's a settlement. We're looking at the of, settlement of the September, the September contract. contract. So there's an official Over settlement, under. and it's thirty two eighty. I can't believe under. you're bamboozling me because you know something about the way these things fucking settle, and I don't. And you're like you're you got an edge, <laughs> but I feel good that this is gonna work in my favor. I'm in. Okay, that's good. Pitcher a beer. We're on. Okay. All right. All right. So, uh, so that's uh, that's where we're going to leave it. So, uh, Kev, uh, some closing words. So, thanks for tuning into the Market Huddle. We appreciate you all spending the time with us. Please give us a follow at the Market Huddle. We're on Twitter every day. Give Lena a shout out. She gets tired of talking to Patrick and I. You can listen to the Market Huddle on all the networks: Google Podcasts, Podbean, Spotify, Android Play iTunes and YouTube. A lot of people watch on YouTube to see all of our charts and visuals. And while you're there, please like and subscribe to get our latest content. And please, if you could rate and review us on iTunes, I know it's a dumb game, but it makes a difference to Apple's algorithms and it helps us out immensely. Patrick, where can they find you? You can find me uh, on Twitter at Patrick Sresen. By the way, I got an imposter. Someone. Oh, uh, nice. Some, it's because you, you really uh, made it, man. You really made oh, it. Oh, yeah. Dude, whatever. You know what? It's, <laughs> someone just sees that they can, uh, they, they can uh, uh, scam somebody. So everyone follow the imposter. <laughs> no, don't do it. Don't do it. I'm, I'm not kidding. even going to say it. I'm handle. just kidding. I'm just joking. We should legitimately. Just don't trust anyone other than the, uh, the original Patrick Serezna. Which is not the original at- Patrick Serezna. It's just Patrick Serezna <laughs> on Twitter. Give them your it's website, at, Patrick. It's at Patrick Ceresna, and uh, you can uh, also find me at, at bigpicturetrading.com. And for me, I'm at Kevin Muir on Twitter, and you can go to my newsletter at themacrotourist.substack.com. And listen, you can never have too many friends. Bear market, bull market. We're just happy to spend some time together on this crazy ride. So thanks for tuning in. Now stick around for the after show. Okay, All right. Lena and Taylor. Okay, what did you hey. think of the betting? I loved it. Uh, I feel like you guys missed one of the currencies. I just realized. Which one? The loser has to wear market hat of men's. No, 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 oh. no, 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 no. That's a very, very special. That's not even listed. And plus, that's yeah. that's that's like I've a already whole... lost that. I have to get that done. Because that's the loser has to wear the menswear to the steak dinner bed. Uh, that's that's but Kevin's yeah. already lost. Yeah, he I has gotta, to gotta, wear that to one of our meetups settle. once COVID's over. Yeah. That's got to settle. And that is a special thing when we need to go nuclear on a bet. <laughs> that's right. Like when a, <laughs> when a steak dinner is not enough. That's right. We're going there. <laughs> but we're not, even gonna, we're not even going to list it on the screen. It's, a, it's not even a choice. It's just somewhere we go. Okay. All right. So All right. we got to talk beer. Yes. Yeah. I know Taylor doesn't have it, so he's not going to be able to talk beer. But Patrick, before we talk beer, I have to talk a little bit about Lake of the Woods. Very, you know, deep and dear to my heart. All right. It's got a like a float plane on it. This, the picture of the Forgotten Lake Blueberry Ale. Yeah. And for those who don't know, Lake of the Woods has a shoreline of 25,000 miles. But if you count wow. the shorelines of all the islands, it has 65,000 miles of shoreline. That's more than Lake Superior. There are 14,522 islands in Lake of the Woods. It would be the longest wow. coastline of any Canadian lake, except that the lake is not entirely within Canada. Here's the question for you. What are the provinces and states that Lake of the Woods are in? Anyone can answer. Okay. No looking at Google. Oh, shit. I was just on there. I can't yeah. answer now. I'm looking at the map. Uh, Lena? Taylor? Oh, wow. I don't even know where it is exactly. Uh, honestly, <laughs> I don't honest. Yeah, have any, uh, <laughs> like, I, I, I was taught geography, like, on a phone, not in a textbook. <laughs> so, but I, it, I have no idea. It's it, Correct me if I'm ro- uh, wrong on Google. <laughs> But it's Minnesota, Ontario, and uh, and Manitoba, right? You're absolutely right. 
Now, what I like about wow. Lake of the Woods is that that was where we talked about the muskie that, that bit someone, right? Yeah. That's where it was from. Oh, is that where it yeah. was? Oh. The lady got, who got bit yeah. or whatever. Um, like a shark oh. attack. That's how the, that's how the muskies run there. Anyways, wow. beautiful country, beautiful place. Lots of good memories. Let's talk beer now. Okay. <laughs> it is god awful. It's the fact that you put blueberry in a you can't like this just shows you you cannot put a you cannot put a fruit in a beer. Oh my god, I miss. Wait, no, but we had we had something fruity last no. week. And yeah, and, and what did good. I rate it? Sub five. So listen, because this is um, a Lake of the Woods beer, and thank you for Lake of the Woods Brewing Company for this wonderful reminder of where I grew up and stuff. I'm giving it a five one. You're you're squeaking by. Squeaking by. That's all. That's the only reason it's getting through. All right, Lena, your turn. Yeah. Um, I didn't particularly love it, but I also didn't particularly hate it. So, oh I I don't know if it's something that I will go out of my way to purchase per se, but I, if it's there, I will drink it. So I would give it a solid seven point two. There you go, Patrick. So. I, I was going to say the same kind of uh, line of, well, I, I don't hate it, but uh, it's I don't love it. I would pro- I w- my, my rating to get above seven and a half is uh, would I buy a six pack of it? And uh, the answer is probably not. So I'm going to give it just a seven and a half. I'll give it the highest score because it, I did enjoy drinking it. It's uh, and do you enjoy drinking all beers? Yes, I do. Actually, no, I've given the score below five. Rarely. I almost never. Well, like Kevin's the only one that shits on everything all the time. Uh, but I'm going to give it a seven and a half. I'm happy with my score. I'm leaving it at that. Okay. So wow. um, I actually got asked the other day. Patrick. Oh, one second. I, I, sorry. I'm, I'm all, over, all over the place. But Patrick, I cheated on you this week. Oh, where did you cheat with me? I, so, Again. Yeah, so Patrick is a serial uh, cheater. Yes. He basically Everyone. does it on you a right. Ra- no, you guys said last week you guys have an open relationship. That's right. That's right. You have an open yeah. relationship, but I just don't, I don't like use that openness like Patrick does. Patrick does it like <laughs> there's a standing date. And I just kind of go, I sit you, at home. You give me an inch, I take a foot. That's right. right. Like, I sit at home on a Thursday night going, when's he going to be back? And like. <laughs> I wonder who he's yeah, with. Yeah, he, he comes back. <laughs> Patrick smells like the macro huddle. Yeah. Or the <laughs> no. macro voices. Macro voices. <laughs> That's that, that's musky, right. that musky smell. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, our good friend Rob Coitman had me on his show. Oh, you and, know what? I'm actually scheduled in a, uh, in a month. Oh, God. You know I'm what? I, I used to feel good about this, and now I find out you're cheating on me right behind my back. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, it's I'll, okay. I'll, Anyways, he's actually uh, did very Did you say nice. anything? Did you say something interesting? No, I didn't. I so. never <laughs> did. But one of the <laughs> one of the things that he asked me is that he said um, he asked what um, if I had listened to any good shows lately, and I. Oh, have thanks fa- pre- for prepping me. Yeah, you'll probably get that. Anyway, so um, yeah, you, well, Patrick, you're going to tell him all about something that you discovered, friends or something crazy like that. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I, I don't know if either Lena or Taylor, because I, I know Patrick will be a no, but have you guys seen this show called Catastrophe? No. No. Oh, oh yes. Yeah, my, my wife uh, watched it. It's with Rob Delaney, yeah. right? I am, yeah, yeah. I am a, a, a size buyer of this show. I loved it. It's about an American that uh, goes to London and has a one-night affair, or actually a six-night affair with a woman, gets her pregnant, and then comes and lives with her and raises the kid. I think it's outstanding. I think it's one of the best shows I've seen in a long time. Have you watched all the way to the end? Yeah, I actually did. I, I did. Uh, I did like Alina, and I and I finished it. Uh, yeah, it's <laughs> great. It, it's really like it's really heartfelt and honest, and there's a lot of real. It, yeah, I'm a buyer. Oh, you watched it? Yeah, I watched a bunch of it. Like my wife is a TV writer, so uh, oh, okay. I I like by peripheral, I've seen everything. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things that I found interesting was that this guy was like a former alcoholic that was on Twitter and was just used to make fun of himself. Like when he started, he put himself in the what he said was the most embarrassing, grossest picture he could find, which was him in a speedo at the beach. And he just got on Twitter and started doing funny stuff. And this was like, I don't know, eight years ago. 
and he got a following. He was like the original kind of guy, but he's shockingly good actor. Like I, I like I, I was just actually flabbergasted that he was so good because he's literally yeah. just a Twitter star that's got himself a, a gig as a as a comedian. Yeah, wow. there was a. He, I think he did Conan. I think he did Conan, or he did a set once, and uh, he was bombing. It was like a late night show, and he was just bombing really hard. Yeah. And I was like, oh, you know, haha, Rob Delaney, and I used to be involved in comedy a bunch, so I was like, oh, this guy, you know, he's not so special. I could do that, yeah. and uh, <laughs> you know, and then I saw him in the show, and I was like, god damn, this guy's really good. <laughs> <laughs> he is good. Like he really, I think I good. thought he really did a good job. Anyways, that's my show. How about you guys? You guys watch anything recently that's good? I watched Fear City, what's, the docu series on Netflix. I went back to Netflix this week. Uh, it's Fear City. I thought you, I thought you watched Net, all of Netflix. Oh, Lena. Yeah, and then I saw that there was something new. I think new, I watched so that. I check it out. Yeah, with the, about yeah. mafia in the New York it's City. Good. Um, it's It's about really Ru- Rudy Giuliani, and it's about when he took down the five yeah, families. It was. Yeah, it was. It was really yeah. good. Um, what was it called? It's kind of. I wasn't paying attention. Fear, Fear City. City, New York versus the mafia. Yeah. It's docu. I think it was three episodes or yeah, four episodes. I can't good. remember, but it was. It's like short docu series, and it was. What epic. I like best is that that when they arrested all of them, there was like one of the family guys was uh, the head of the families was this almost businessman, and he was he said all these things about like I I'm gonna stand cor- like I'm he he defended himself in a very eloquent way and, and said that he almost sounded like a lawyer or a businessman. And then one of the other guys was just like, fuck you. I'm going to, like, take you down. Like, I'm, like, <laughs> I'm not talking to yeah. reporters. <laughs> remember? Do you remember that? And I was like, yeah, I kind of yeah, like yeah. that second guy. <laughs> the second guy actually looks yeah. the part, right? He looks like a mob. I, so I can't remember like which guys were which. But, yeah, it was movies. a good. I like that. It was a good show. Yeah, that was that was that's right up my alley. And I've, now that I've finished that, I'm saying bye to Netflix for another month. That's right. Month until you find something new. There's new things. Yeah. <laughs> How about you, Taylor? That's Did right. you listen to or watch anything good up there in, Hur- uh, in Lake Huron? Yeah, well, we, uh, my wife it got into like uh, TIFF, which is Toronto uh, oh. uh, International Film Festival. And she got oh. in as like, yeah, almost like a, like a, you know, writer to watch, breakout type of writer. And uh, so they gave her um, um, some tickets, uh, but it's all online this year. So, Last night we watched a movie called Get the Hell Out. It's this Thai, you know, here you go. It's a eclectic, weird movie. It's this Thai, Taiwanese movie. And um, it's kind of like a, it's like a zombie horror comedy slasher. It's hilarious. And it's so unique and original. Like it was like laugh out loud. And uh, it was very, very interesting. Very original. It was almost like a Kill Bill um, type of, I don't know. It's a very interesting movie. So nice. that's what I watched. Yeah. Sorry, what is it called? Get the hell it's out. It's called Get the hell out. I think we'll have to wait. Us Get mortals will have to wait till it comes out. <laughs> Us mortals. <laughs> yeah, you guys will. Yeah, it's it's good. It's totally good. Is it gory? It's it's like fun gory. Like no, no, there's no gore. It's really like you know a guy will oh. like um, nail clipper some guy's neck artery and then it'll just be like a, a fire hose of blood. You know. So not Corey it's, at all. It's not like, Corey at all. <laughs> yeah. So it's kind of like Ash versus Evil Dead sort of situation. Yeah, something or, like that. Okay. But even even lighter yeah. than that. This is very, just like a lot of just <laughs> people pushing each other around. It's like a, it's great. So I, I know I haven't uh, said anything really, but it's good. <laughs> Patrick. <laughs> well, we'll just have to we're wait. We're supposed to we'll know. To Patrick, do you realize there, everything they were talking about I didn't understand? I'm Googling it trying to figure out what Ash versus Evil Dead is. What is this, Lena? <laughs> There was a there was a TV show with uh oh my gosh what's his name his name escapes me now but um, I want to say Bruce Campbell is that his yeah, name yeah Bruce Campbell is it is it the yeah, guy from I think uh, he's the one uh, that show oh who is he oh I don't even know if you see his face you'll be like oh that guy Bruce Campbell I'm looking him up to see where this guy yeah, is Bruce Campbell he's the guy they did that horror in the horror in the woods and he had a chainsaw as a hand. Yeah. And he like goes yeah. back and then he goes back in time. I don't know any of his stuff. No. You guys are in Cabin in the Woods. League. I don't know what you guys no. like. What do you guys watch? I thought it was a cult. <laughs> like what the hell? <laughs> what do you 
Yeah. I don't, you know, uh, you guys. This is this is what separates the yeah. Gen Z and the millennials. Yeah, speaking of that. Don't you guys just wa- <laughs> Sir, go ahead, Taylor. Oh, I was just going to make funny guys by saying <laughs> that you just. You're like, don't you just listen to music on the radio? <laughs> You know, it's like, no, why don't you just listen to what they tell you to listen to? I, you know what? I figured this thing out is called satellite radio. It's even better. <laughs> satellite oh radio. Oh, my God. Do you know what the most so popular funny. channel on satellite radio is? I think we've done this. We've oh, done this. I've done it. Okay. Do the same joke I did last time. What, which was? Well, give it to me. What? <laughs> it was... Yeah, yeah, what's the most popular? What's the most popular one, Kev? It's the '80s show, '80s channel. Yeah, it's the '80s show. Yeah, oh, and that's like, right, right. you know, you go to an old folks' home and you're like, hey, can you <laughs> can you believe the most popular uh, juice here is prune juice? <laughs> Isn't that crazy? <laughs> prune juice must be really good. <laughs> that is I'm a good joke. That is hey a good man, joke. Hey man, it keeps oh, you regular. It that's keeps a good you joke. regular. I like a good joke. Anyways, yeah, no, um, I know. You guys listen to some and watch some really crazy stuff. I don't. I've never heard of any of this. It's not crazy. Hey, it's not it's crazy. Not. It's good. It's like a. It's like a campy horror movie yeah. or horror yeah. TV okay. show. So funny how we didn't ask Patrick. Let's see what. Let's try yeah. to include Patrick. No, don't on even. This. No, no, don't Patrick. What did me. you do this weekend? Uh, I uh, I was uh, out partying with uh, at a couple of uh, barbecues and had some get-togethers, but I did not watch any TV. Yeah. So See, I, again, I wish Patrick's I could... partying. It's probably all you guys have been to it again, and I haven't gone. Uh, no. <laughs> yeah. I was there. Yeah. Lena I was, there. was invited. I wish I had taken some it. pictures. Yeah, yeah. yeah don't trip. Don't. I wish I had taken some pictures yeah. of Patrick. Why? Towards the end. So Because I was slurring? I'm pretty sure at one point you were laying sideways oh, and come talking on. to me and slurring your words. <laughs> <laughs> Fake news. Like you're, you're like Fox or CNN. Yeah. <laughs> Am I fake news? Really? I was I was in great you shape. Think people would believe I was you in believe great me. shape. <laughs> I have no idea yeah, what I'm laying down sideways during I was shape. not. Oh my god. Yeah, he's I'm glad there. he's laying You know what? Unless you have video evidence it never happened and that's it. <laughs> so, For those who don't know right. Patrick, my memory. I, I have not gone out with him a lot, but I'll tell you the one time I did go out with him. Oh. We were in Chicago presenting at something. What was it? Some trader uh, conference. It was the, or money, the money show. Where yeah. we, that was where we had the big bull bear debate on the bonds. Yeah, okay. And you yeah. lost. Okay. And you lost. Yeah, because there's it's, COVID. Because uh, you it, knew COVID was coming. Anyways, listen. Oh, no. Because 2018, you were bearish bonds. Okay. And how'd that work out for you? So, anyway. So. Patrick and I are out. It's like we have to present <laughs> the next day. We're already two nights into it. Like, this is the second night. And before we're going out, and it's like 1.30 in the morning, and I'm like, let's go home, go to bed. We have to get up and present at like 8 o'clock or whatever. Patrick's like, one more, one more. This guy, he does not know how to say no. He just goes and goes and goes. PPP showed up? Pardon? <laughs> Triple P. Triple P, yeah. Up? For those who don't Triple know, P? it's peer pressure peer Pat. Peer pressure Patrick. He really, oh, my God. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> like, <laughs> He has that. In, um, he has that embroidered in his jacket. I don't doubt oh it. He, it is true. <laughs> and, it, and he turns into, it just hits this point where he doesn't, like, it kind of goes over the edge and then it just kind of accelerates. Well, you, it's well, like kind of a, it's a like reputation it's are you like, guys giving like me on fucking air? The first air. little bit is fine like, and then it just accelerates when there's. I've when never, I down. never drink. Yeah. I never. <laughs> on that I'm note, like Taylor. You never like drink I, in your yeah. sleep. On that note, anyway. let's call it a night. I got yeah. I got some uh, burgers priest that I see my my family's ordering me. Ooh, so oh, there you go. Ooh, so yeah. jealous. And, all right. and that's what I'll be ordering when Patrick loses all of his bets. I hey listen, if you guys if any of our listeners made it this far in the show, it's about let four us of know them. what you guys think of uh yeah, all four of them. Uh, let us know what you guys thought of the new format. I'd well, love to Unless you don't like it, at which point just screw off. Yeah, d- like, don't bother yeah, telling screw us off. that. Because it's staying. <laughs> I love it. It's fun. I, I'm looking forward to, to betting with Patrick every week. I can't wait till he tries to, to catch me on something. I I, I, I can't. Oh, yeah, th- it was the worst because I, I was. So I have a question like, for you. Thinking, actually, one second. Before we leave. I went 32.80, and I'd actually screwed up. I had said 32.75 because I realized that you were already leaning that way. Uh, what would have been the number that you would have flipped the other way? Like if I had said 32.50, what I, I think I think I think that you basically chose a pretty good uh, a pretty good level. I mean, like you. 
I uh, because there's a point where it's it's better odds just taking the yeah yeah anyway yeah you chose a pretty safe level it was it was enough of a margin where it was I still wanted my bearish slant yeah. to okay uh, to be so it. if I gone five more I might have got it but if I gone twenty more I would no would've... twenty twenty more I would have given yeah if you went like twenty or fifty points more that would have definitely taken the other side okay. Anyways, thanks for listening. But I'm everyone. giving you too much information. I know you I'm are. Giving, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not going to say anymore. You're yet. a fool. <laughs> anyway, thanks everyone for listening this long. Hopefully, we'll see you next week. All right, thanks everyone. Have a great night. Have a great weekend, guys.